over the last six months, I've been working on a, a model of what the universe could look like from a geocentric point of view. Um, obviously, we've got the mainstream point of view, which is obviously very um, wrong in many ways um, and possibly right in other ways as well, which I'm going to try and prove today. Um, but the ancients, quite obviously, knew a lot more than, than we know today about, um, about these truths. So I used a method that I learned off Santos, uh, the method of um, syncretism, um, to try and connect the dots and come up with a cohesive, um, geocentric universe that makes sense at least. Of course, we'll never know the truth, the whole truth, naturally, in this state of consciousness. Um, but I think we can certainly get as close to it as possible through syncretism um, and, and other means as well. Um, so that's what I've done. I've syncretized um, mainly four avenues. I've syncretized Vedic um, scriptures, um, Kemetic Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, Norse mythology, a bit of the Bible, and a bit of the science we're taught today, mainstream science. There's a, a lot of truth in there. Um, we just have to be able to, to decipher what they're telling us, but they are telling us quite a few truths, which I think um, might be a bit controversial in the um, flat earth community, but uh, I'm sure my argument is gonna be quite compelling, hopefully. Right, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start from the beginning. Um, my presentation is based on the cosmic egg theory, the theory that our universe is inside um, an egg or a shell, um, which is actually a torus field. Okay, everything is, is, is toroidal. Um, so I'm gonna start from the beginning. Right, so in the beginning, all cultures and even mainstream science tells us that there was nothing, absolutely nothing, the void, emptiness, empty space. Um, today, science calls it infinite space, time, and matter, okay? Um, past cultures also had names for this. Um, the Greeks called it the chaos. Um, the Norse um, called it the gunning gap. Um, the Egyptians called it the noon. Um, this is the void. This is everything and nothingness. This is the, the multiverse, okay? Um, I think there's no way to express it or to explain it in any words um, or level of consciousness that we have now. So we're gonna try and use words that we can relate to at best. This space is intelligent, conscious, it is beautiful, it is divine, it is holy. So if I use certain words, um, they're not going to do this justice, um, whatever this is, this infinite space, time and matter. This is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, so that was everything and nothingness, the void of infinite potential to begin with. At some point, this void decided to separate a part of itself to create and experience life outside itself because it can. Um, this is the nature of infinite potential. Um, to use that potential. And the first creation from our point of view was what we know as the Holy Trinity, okay? Which I've drawn there as the, uh, you can see the Vesica Pisces there, you can see the flower of life. This is the first form of creation in our universe. Mainstream science today calls this the point of singularity or the great attractor. It's the same thing. Religion would call it uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, protons, neutrons, electrons, um, Zeus, um, Poseidon, and, uh, and uh, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Um, many cultures called it different things. You, you'll find that the gods or the creators in all cultures always are in threes. They're always in threes. So three is the magic number of creation. Okay? So... These are the building blocks of life. I prefer to call it um, electromagnetic pulses of sine wave or frequency, which is basically a star. This is the first star. This is God, the creator. We are all stars. Everything is a tomb, as, um, as Santos always says. Everything's a star. It, it's all 
it's all the same thing. We are stars. The sun that we look up at, you know, in the sky is a star. The stars in the firmament are stars. God is a star. Creation is a star. Right? At different frequencies, at different levels of consciousness, etc., etc. So uh, we've got the Holy Trinity now. We've got the building blocks of life. The first order of business was to create a home or a hub or a shell where it would experience life separate from the whole. So obviously, remember, this Holy Trinity is still in the void. It's still in the, in the infinite potential. But it needs to have its own world in order to create um, and, and experience life. And by the way, that, that Holy Trinity basically is where the meaning of life is. Before I move on, really important. Okay, in Vedic cosmology, you've got um, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, creator, sustainer, and the destroyer. And that is life. That is the cycle of life, birth, experience, and death. That, those, that, that is the, the blueprint of, of, of existence as we know it. Those are the three things we all know for certain. There is no debate. Everyone is born. Everything is created. Everything lives and everything has to die and will die at some stage. So that's the first rule of creation. Okay. And that is what this Holy Trinity is. And that's where it began. Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Now, it is also worth mentioning that death is never permanent. Okay. Death is never permanent. If we're all stars, like I've said, um, stars never die. Stars are energy. Energy goes and lives forever. So what we truly, truly are lives forever. However, the experiences that we have in their different forms have to die at some stage, which is what reincarnation is. So you are born in this body, in this life, in this age, at this time. You live and you experience um, whatever you're experiencing at that time, but that must die. That experience must die for you to experience something new, which is what reincarnation is, which is the point of life because you have to learn from that, you grow from that, you move on. So that's the meaning of life. The meaning of life is um, creation, experience, um, growth, and moving on. And then it repeats itself. And you see that with, with everything, with a tree. A tree um, grows, it lives, it bears fruit or whatever, um, it dies, and then the next season it grows fruit again, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. Energy never ever dies. So death, permanent death, does not exist and never will because everything is energy and energy is infinite. Like I've said, all this came from infinite space, time and matter. Infinite, meaning forever. So there's no such thing as permanent death. Death is temporal, it's temporary. Okay, moving on. So they needed to create a world where they could express these three things the cycle of birth, experience, and death. Because those things don't exist in the void, in the car, obviously, because that's infinite potential. So the first thing they built was this, a tourist field, right? A shell, to shell themselves from the void, from the car. They're now independent, they're now separate, they're now experiencing life outside the hull, okay? Now in that void, by the way, in the car, there are many, many other universes and many, many other expressions of experience that are different to us. So this is not unique. We're not the only shell or egg in the universe or in the multiverse. There are many, many of these, right? But this is ours. This is where we are, okay? So they created this egg, as many cultures called it. Um, the Vedics called it the Brahmanda. Uh, the... Norse mythology, they called it Ymir, the god Ymir, was expressed through the god Ymir. Um, in Greek mythology, it's the Ophian egg. Um, in uh, Kemetic e Egyptian uh, mythology, they called it the, um, the Apep, the serpent Apep. And it's always depicted as a snake or a serpent, which is energy. If you see a snake in ancient mythology, it's always expressing energy. Okay? So this is the torus field, electromagnetic torus field that was built. And inside, you've now got primordial waters. It's empty. This is when the Big Bang happened. So when mainstream science says the Big Bang happened at the point of singularity, there's some truth in that. What they're not telling us is that that singularity 
and that process is a conscious, intelligent creation. It is not a random um, uh, process. It's not something that happened randomly. It was intelligently designed. Again, that star is far more intelligent than we are. If we are a star, we are probably at 5% intelligence. This intelligence is at 100, okay? Just to put it into context, that's obviously not accurate, but anyway. So now we've got a womb, right? This is the womb of creation. This is now the universe, our universe, okay? Move on to slide number four. The next bit was for these three entities to um, choose their domains, basically, in this universe. At the top, you've got Brahma, who's the creator. In the middle, you've got Vishnu, the sustainer, which is life. At the bottom, you've got Shiva, which is destruction, the destroyer. So now, the one is now divided into three, okay? Um, at the top, this is where the, that 33.333% comes in, the number 33. This is why it's so big in, in a lot of these cultures, number 33, because the universe is divided into that, into three aspects. 33.333333 makes the whole, okay? So now we've got at the top, positive polarity, okay? The beginning, creation, in the middle, we've got life, sustenance, and experience. This is where the circle of life happens. And at the bottom, we've got the end, death, destruction, negative polarity, right? These two are gravity, okay? So when mainstream science says that gravity exists, it kind of does, but it's a transcendental gravity. It's not a physical gravity, it's transcendental, okay? You've got blue shift and red shift. If you've watched Santos's videos, he talks about that quite a lot, red shift and blue shift. This is where it begins. This is the original blue shift and red shift. Blue shift at the top, red shift at the bottom, okay? The next order of business was to create a cosmic highway, okay? Because at the moment, everything within this is closed off from the whole, from the multiverse, from all the other universes and all the other experiences outside this egg, okay? So a cosmic highway was created in the middle of this, um, of this egg. Just make it easier. If that's an egg, right? That is the cosmic highway going down through the center. Okay? Connecting the outside multiverse, the void, the you know, other universe with us inside here. We are now inside. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva are inside this universe. Right? Creating, experiencing, and destroying whatever they, they feel like creating, sustaining, and destroying. Right? Okay. So that, that is what this is. This is a cross section, okay? So now we've got a cosmic vortex. This is what science calls the axis. Yep, the cosmic axis, okay? Many cultures um, called it many things. In Greek mythology, it was personified as the Greek god Elus, the keeper of the winds. Um, in Vedic mythology, it's known as uh, the Merudanda, okay? In Kemetic Egypt, it's Horus. I think it was a falcon also keeper of the winds or something to do with the winds. Um, in Norse mythology, they talk about the Bifrost Bridge. Same thing. This is the spine. This is a black hole, if you like. Sometimes science says the black hole in the universe. This is the black hole. Um, this is the father and keeper of winds, energy, flow of weather, currents, everything starts from here. Starts from this energy in the middle. This is the engine room right, powering everything inside this cosmic egg, right? So now we've got that. So the next bit was to now put form to the universe, okay? So now we've established, we've got at the top, we've got blue shift, blue fire, okay? At the bottom, we've got red fire, red shift. These are both polarity, magnetism. Okay, different forms of magnetism, you know, um, uh, different modalities of magnetism, okay? In the middle, we now have the ether, okay? We've got air. At the bottom, we've got the water. In the Bible, they say God said, um, God separated the waters above from the waters below. So the waters above are the atmospheres. The waters below 
are the actual waters below. Okay, in the middle is where Earth comes in. Okay, this is where Earth. The Kemetic Egyptians said in the middle, in the beginning, God created um, the Ben Ben, and Ben Ben translates to mound or pyramid. Okay, so a mound or a pyramid was created. This is Gaia in Greek mythology. It's Geb, Mother Geb in Kemetic um, Egypt. Um, same thing, right? So this tells me that this must be a pyramid of some sort, the earth originally, and probably still is today. Now you see those elements that we always talk about. Earth, wind or air or ether, water and fire, building blocks of life. Right, these are the first physical building blocks of life in our universe. Right, earth where we are, the air above us, atmosphere, the waters below us, and the fire would be the heavens and the hells, top and bottom. Right, this is the Buloka in Vedic cosmology. Right, I'll try and um, okay, let's go into detail. Right, this Buloka, right, the Egyptians said it was the Ben Ben, a pyramid. And I think it looks something like this, okay? As above, so below. So it's a pyramid at the top and a pyramid at the bottom, okay? Right? I think at the center here, at some stage, there was a capstone, right? Which I'll explain in a, in a minute. At the moment, it's a crater, but I'll explain that in detail in a moment. Now, mainstream science tells us that our Earth has got three layers, three inner layers. There's a crust, a mantle, an inner core, and an outer core, right? But they tell us that this is on a spinning ball. I'm saying that it is not. What they're actually trying to tell us is that these are the four layers in the Ben Ben. This is the cross section, by the way, okay? And I'll show you what, what it is a cross section of. The crust, the mantle, the inner core, and the outer core inside the earth, which is basically, This. This is the Ben Ben. This is the Earth. But this is the top half. So if you imagine this at the top, there's also a bottom bit, an upside down pyramid. Okay? And that is sitting on the great deep, on the waters below. And above, you've got the waters above, which are the atmospheres. Right? So when they tell us that the Earth has got three layers a crust, a mantle, an inner core, and an outer core that is inner Earth inside this Ben Ben, the layer between the two pyramids. So there's some truth in that, okay? So I found that really, really um, interesting when I came across that, okay? The ancient cultures also talk about these, um, this Ben Ben in quite a lot of detail, okay? The um, Egyptians called it Geb, Mother Geb, the Indo-Vedics, the Buloka, which is the land. Um, in, in Greek, it was Mother Gaia. And in Norse mythology, it was Midgard, okay? The top, the top of this also had names, okay? So the whole thing has got a name. In Kemetic Egypt, it's the Ben Ben, right? But on the top, this is Mother Geb. If you're looking from the top, this was Mother Geb, okay? In Greek mythology, the whole thing is Gaia. But the top, as you see it with these concentric rings, is Atlantis or Atlas, okay? In um, Norse mythology, they just call it all Midgard, okay? They had one name for it. In Vedic cosmology or in Vedic scripts, they call the whole thing the Bur Loka, but the top is the Bu Mandala. The concentric rings are the Bu Mandala. Okay, it's also interesting that in Greek mythology, they said that Mother Gaia had two children. Okay, this is Mother Gaia, the whole thing, had two children. Who are the two children? 
The two children are the top part and the bottom part, Prometheus and Epimetheus. These are the two held be below us. Okay? Right? I hope that makes sense. So I'll move on to the next slide. Right. Now that we established that this is what the whole earth looks like, our entire earth is a pyramid gumandala with four concentric rings. Right? One, two, three, four. Everything is in fours in the universe. Right? All creation is in fours in the universe. Right? At the center, we've got what we now know as the Garden of Eden. So anyone who's been following our videos will know about this. The Garden of Eden is at the center. This is where we are here, the second ring. There's an outer ring and an outer ring outside that, all separated by these mountains, what we call the Antarctica ice wall. Okay, this is our South Pole, the Antarctica. And the North Pole, there is a mountain range separating us from the world at the center, from Eden, from Shambhala, Hyperborea. Okay? And outside, they've got their own wall separating from this. This last one has got the greatest one. It's called the Loka Loka Mountains in Vedic scriptures. These are the Loka Loka Mountains, the great, great mountains. Right? And these are the last mountains before the Taurus field, the cosmic egg. Okay? So beyond this, there is no land. It's the cosmic egg locking us out from the void outside. Right? So let's focus on the center, on where we are, and what that might look like. Okay? There's some really important bits. Okay. Around... Okay. Around each of these four worlds is also a Taurus field. So remember, this is in the Taurus field. Each of these worlds also has its own Taurus field cocooning it. So there's a Taurus field around this outer world. There's a Taurus field around this one. There's a Taurus field around that one. And there's a Taurus field at the center. Okay? And what that would look like, essentially... is something like this, okay? From our perspective, from where we are, right? Almost like those Russian dolls, right? So there's one at the center, a Taurus field like that. There's one on the outside, on the outer worlds, a bigger one. Then there's a bigger one on the outside, right? Now, I noticed something very interesting about this. These toroidal fields, right, are probably oblate spheroids in shape. So when mainstream science or NASA says the Earth is an oblate spheroid, this is what they're telling us. They're kind of telling us a half-truth, right? Which is why they can blatantly lie with a straight face. Because they know they're usurping the truth. And when it comes out, they'll just probably say, well, you're too stupid to understand what we're saying. But we're telling you the truth. So this is an oblate spheroid. Underneath where we are, this is where the four layers would be. The crust, the mantle, inner core, and outer core just like mainstream science says, right? Inner Earth. And above us, we've got the three atmospheres within our toroidal field. We've got the troposphere, the stratosphere, right? The mesosphere and the thermosphere inside our torus field. This top bit is what um, mainstream science calls the Van Allen belt. This is the Van Allen belt, this toroidal field. Right? They tell us there's a field of energy that they cannot go past called the Van Allen belt. This is it. By the way, they also tell us that there are five Van Allen belts in the universe. So that's the four of the worlds, the fifth one being the outermost one. They also tell us that our universe is um, covered with um, cosmic background microwave radiation which is basically a torus field. So they're telling us that the whole universe is inside a torus field. Cosmic background radiation, electromagnetism. So again, they're telling us the truths, but in a twisted way so that we don't figure out exactly what it is. 
Okay, so that is what it would look like from our perspective. Right, I also hypothesize that these toroidal fields have got different motions that they're moving at. Okay, so science tells us that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour on its axis, yeah? And then it's spinning at 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. And then it's spinning at 490,000 miles an hour in the universe. Again, there is some truth in that. So it's not a complete lie. So the terra firma we're standing on is obviously not spinning, but the toroidal fields around us are spinning, okay? So I've depicted it here on this cross section, okay? So here, we've got the pyramid Bumandala. We've got the toroidal fields going around each of the lands, over and underneath, right? One at the center, two where we are, three on the outside world, and the fourth one on the furthest out world, okay? Our toroidal field is probably moving at a thousand miles an hour that vortex. And this toroidal field, which has been powered, well, all of them are being powered by that cosmic vortex that we talked about in the beginning. This is the engine room that's powering the energy of all these toroidal fields, right? Because that runs straight through the middle, okay? So that's moving at a thousand miles an hour on its axis, which is that axis, just like mainstream science tells us. The next toroidal field is moving at 67,000 miles an hour around our sun, which I'll explain why in a minute. And the outer one is moving in our universe at 490,000 miles an hour, the last one. So if these figures are true, and my syncretism is true, or it, it's close, then this is what I think that means, okay? Right, the next bit, is I want to focus on Where I put it? our Taurus field and our Earth, where we are. Okay, so that's a cross section of it, the one that I was showing you earlier on. So that is where we would be, the terra firma, the Earth, where we're standing here. This would be the lands at the center, Eden with its torus field, which mainstream science tells us quite clearly, it's an electromagnetic field at the center. At the North Pole, there's an electromagnetic field, which is a torus field, powered by the sun, so they say. So they're telling us there's a torus field at the center, okay? And this is the Van Allen belt that they tell us about, right? And then we've got the four atmospheres, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, like I said earlier on. Underneath us is Earth. Right? This is the ground. The crust, the mantle, inner core, outer core. And the waters and everything else sit above. On the terra firma. Okay? Right. Each of these lands with the four different toroidal fields has got a sun and a moon. All of the lands have a sun and a moon. Okay? So... Let's look at it like that. Right? If that was the top of our toroidal field from the top, this is where we live. Okay? Our torus field, our sun and moon, is the sun and moon that we see every day that revolves around our torus field. These outer lands have got their own sun and moon which are Mars and Venus, okay? This outer land, they've got their own sun and moon as well, which is Saturn and Jupiter, the planets Saturn and Jupiter. The center is the only one that's an exception because the sun and moon there are androgynous and that's the planet Mercury. So Mercury is both a sun and a moon, okay, at the center. So now we've got the seven wandering planets. Mercury at the center, inside the sun, like mainstream science tells us, right? You've got the moon, the sun, on the outside, Venus, Mars, um, Jupiter, and Saturn being the last one. So 
Saturn, Mars, and Apollo are suns, right? On the other side, you've got our moon, Venus, and Jupiter, which are moons, okay? And they've got their uh, respective duties or things that they do, which I'll explain a little bit later, okay? So I'll try and put this together so you can kind of see what it looks like inside the egg. Okay. So now we have, we have the universe. Okay. I don't know if you can see it properly. Hopefully you can. Let's put it down a little bit so you can see that. And here it is, okay? That's the top of the Bumandala. And this is the top half of all the Taurus fields. Of course, they run through the bottom as well, with the different suns and moons revolving around these Taurus fields in each of the lands. So, when NASA says they're going to Mars, and they plan to go to Mars, they are telling the truth. Mars are these outside lands, the outer lands, where Mars is the sun, right? That, that is where Mars is. So they are planning to go to these outside worlds at some point. They're saying at the moment they can't get past the Van Allen belt, but at some stage they will be able to. And again, I'll explain why, okay? So this is where Mars is. So outer space does exist. So all flat earthers out there saying that outer space doesn't exist, it does. But it's just been usurped. It's not physically going to Mars itself, the sun Mars, the, the luminary. That, that's ridiculous. It's going to these lands where Mars is the sun. That's what they're trying to tell us. Okay? So I'm going to try and stay on track here. Sometimes I get a bit... So that's what the cross section would look like, okay? You would have the Bumandala over there, different toroidal fields, Mercury, androgynous at the center, Sun and Moon in ours, Mars and Venus in the outer one, Saturn and Jupiter on the outside, Moons and the Suns, Sun and Moon at the center, okay? I think that the Suns, Saturn, Mars, and our sun, they revolve, show you, okay, they spiral around these Taurus fields, okay, upwards and spiral outwards and down. That's what the sun does. I think the moon follows a linear orbit. I don't think it spirals, I think it just follows one one orbit, or if it does spiral, it's a much slower, you know, slower orbit up and down. And I'll explain why again um, a bit later. But I think for sure, the sun and moon, this is what creates our, our, our times, our, our, our seasons. When the sun is up here at the center, this is when the southern, the northern hemisphere have their summers, because the sun is directly above them, above the North Star, above Polaris at the center. When it's out here, spiraling at the edges, this is when the people of the Southern Hemisphere have their summers. So, let's just recap on um, what we've discussed so far, what we've established so far. We've established that our universe is inside a Taurus field, a giant Taurus field. Um, what most um, ancient cultures refer to as the cosmic egg. Similar to this, right? This is the top half of the cosmic egg. And we live inside this Taurus field. We've also established that there is a cosmic vortex that runs through the center of this cosmic egg. This is the cosmic highway that links us with the multiverse on the outside, okay? We've also established that on the inside, the, the Earth is pretty much flat, or it's a pyramid, 
pyramid bumandala as i like to call it that runs across the equator inside our torus field okay with four concentric rings of land right at the center where the cosmic axis or the cosmic highway runs through where we are the second ring the third ring and the fourth ring and the um, torus field on the outside okay we've also established that each of these worlds has its own toroidal field okay so torus field within a torus field within a torus field within a torus field five in total four on the inside the fifth one being um the the outside one the cosmic egg okay right we've established that each of these toroidal fields also has its own sun and moon saturn and jupiter um, revolving around the outer torus field mars and venus on the next toroidal field um, apollo and artemis or our sun and moon on our um, torus field but in the center there is only one um, androgynous sun and moon which is mercury on the inside okay on, on this torus field the aurora borealis okay right so we basically said it looks something like that okay torus field within a torus field right with all the suns and all the moons okay right the next question or the next natural question would be um well what's above these toroidal fields okay above that above all the toroidal fields we've got something known as the firmament okay this is where the stars are this is what we see when you look up at the sky in the evening all the stars and the constellations um this is the firmament that sits above the last inner um, uh, toroidal field, uh, the one that Saturn and Jupiter revolves around. Okay, so that will be the cosmic egg on top. In fact, I'll put it together so you can see it. Full scale on the model. Okay, please bear with me. Okay, so hopefully, okay, so that's what it looks like, right? This would be the firmament inside this torus egg okay the sky that runs across okay so it's almost like a dome okay so we're sealed off from these realms above and i'll explain all that in a second right so when we're looking at it from underneath when we're sat on the earth we're seeing all the um, constellations revolving above us okay so pretty straightforward really so that's the firmament Okay, so this firmament on its axis, right, is revolving. Okay, there's motion, everything's moving above us, but the terra firma we're standing on is obviously not moving. Okay, so this axis is revolving, it's turning the firmament with all the um, stars and the constellations and everything else. In turn, it's also affecting the motions of these toroidal fields that are spinning around us like we discussed earlier on, those toroidal fields are also carrying the suns and moons around, which is causing our days and nights and seasons and times, okay? And that in turn, that motion is also creating our, our weather, our winds, our currents, uh, flows, air streams, everything else. So it's, it's, it's one big system working together. It's a network starting from the cosmic vortex, okay? So I hope that is um, clear enough, okay? So what that would look like is something like this, okay? Now, interestingly enough, okay, we talked about the planets. I suppose many people will be asking, what about Uranus and Neptune 
and Pluto, okay? So I think Uranus and Neptune are the two realms above, okay? So Uranus is the firmament above us. Why am I saying this? Well, Mother Gaia, we all know, is, is Earth in um, uh, Greek mythology, okay? Gaia was married to Uranus, right? The planet Uranus, as they tell us, Uranus, was named after Gaia's husband, Uranus. Uranus married to Uranus. These two are married, okay? They go hand in hand. Same thing with Kemetic Egyptian mythology, okay? You've got Mother Geb, she was married to the, Greek, to, the, to the Egyptian god Nut. And Nut is always depicted as the sky, okay? So Uranus, Nut, um, Uranus, same thing, okay? They also tell us that Uranus and Neptune are kind of planets, but they're exoplanets. They don't go in the same category as these seven wandering stars, okay? They put in a different category, and that's the reason why. Okay, Pluto was the planet Pluto was named after the Greek god of the underworlds, and that's because Pluto is the firmament below us, as above, so below. There's a firmament above us, but there's also a firmament below us. Okay, below the the great sea, the the, the great deep, the Gabadoka Ocean, as the Vedics called it. Okay, so that tells me syncretically that there is a firmament, and what the firmament is. And that shows you how I've come to that conclusion. Okay. Above that, you've got Neptune. Neptune was named after the uh, Greek, the keeper of the waters. Okay. Which waters? The waters above and the waters below. Okay. So Neptune is the keeper of the waters. This is the next realm. By the way, these realms above the firmament are very transcendental. We cannot go to these planets naturally. We all know that. Okay. These are luminaries. These are suns and moons. You can't go to the sun or the moons, okay? Outer space does exist, like I said. It's beyond these Van Allen belts and these lands beyond. This would be outer space, okay? Definitely, we cannot go up here. This place is very, very transcendental. It's spiritual. You can only go there as a soul or a spirit or a star. It's all the same thing, okay? This is the only time you can go up there, and I'll explain all that in a minute. Okay, so mainstream science tells us that there is Uranus, um, Neptune, um, and I'll explain how the heavens work. So there are four heavens and there are four hells. In fact, the Vedics say there are seven heavenly realms and seven hellish realms. Again, we'll go through that in a second. So mainstream science tells us that there's the Milky Way galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, and the Omega galaxy, and then the point of singularity. Okay, this is where Polaris is. Polaris is right at the top, okay? Right in the center of the axis, the cosmic axis, right? Everything is spinning around Polaris, just like we witness with our eyes. When you, when you look up at the North Star, Polaris, you see all the stars are revolving, yeah, around Polaris, okay? Polaris is Brahma, the creator. This is Big Brother. <laughs> so when you see that triangle with the eye, that these elites um, show us, this is what they're trying to tell us, that Big Brother is watching, okay? Unfortunately, they're twisting it and usurping it and making it uh, very occult. It, it shouldn't be an occult thing. This is something everyone should know, okay? This is Big Brother. This is our father. This is Brahma looking out for us, um, basically, um, okay? So, right. Let's... Uh, Let's see what mainstream science says before we move on about the universe. So mainstream science tells us that um, we've got the seven planets, right? We've got Uranus. In fact, they're saying the beginning was the Big Bang, the point of singularity, okay? This is where the Sirius star system is, so they tell us. But they make it very, um, uh, very they, they try and make it like it's a physical thing. But these places are very much transcendental. They're not physical places. Um, these are spiritual, very higher divine. They, you know, we, we shouldn't try and debase it and make it sound very, very simplistic because it's not. It's extreme. It's way beyond our comprehension. But uh, I'm just going to try and relay it the way we're taught in schools. Okay. The Big Bang, point of singularity. This is where 
everything begins. The next um, galaxy is Omega Centauri, okay? Below that is the Andromeda Galaxy. Below that is the Milky Way or Uranus, the firmament. And then we've got all our wandering stars um, below that. That's what mainstream science says, okay? On Pluto at the bottom. Pluto is always an exo-exoplanet. They debate about whether Pluto is a planet or it's not. Do we count it, don't we? And this is why, because Pluto is the firmament below us, okay? Right, let's have a look at what um, the Vedics say about our cosmology. So the Vedics go into a lot, lot more detail, right? The Vedics say there are seven he heavenly realms and there are seven hellish realms, okay? The top realm is called Brahma Loka or Satya Loka, like we said, point of singularity where everything began, the North Star, God, this is the Holy Trinity, this is where they all began, this is where everything started, like I keep saying. The next round down, they called the Tapaloka, okay? Right? The next down, the next round down is the Yanaloka, and then the Mahaloka, right? Or the Svaloka, Svar as in stars, okay? This is now the firmament that we're showing with all the stars and the constellations, what we see when we look up, okay? They call this axis mundi, or where this point meets, um, the druva, okay? This is where uh, the point, or this is where we see um, the sky is meeting with the cosmic axis, or, or, or the pole star, the druva, okay? This is the merudanda that runs through um, the cosmic axis, okay? And then they name all the different stars. Uh, they call Saturn, um, Sanaisuru, they call um, um, Jupiter, Braspati, Mars, Mangal, um, Venus, Sikuru, um, our Sun, Surya, um, our Moon, Chandra, and Mercury at the center, Buddha. Buddha, why Buddha? Buddha the messenger, okay? Buddha was the messenger of God. I'm going to explain why that is important and why Buddha is the messenger at the center. That's very important. They then tell us that there is a Bu, uh, uh, Bu Loka, okay, Bu world, the world of earth, Bu, and this is the Bu Mandala, okay, the earthly plane, right, with the four concentric, they tell us they're concentric rings of land on the Bu Mandala, okay, and they name all these different lands which I won't go into right now, but we'll do that for another video, okay, so these are now the seven heavenly realms, the Varthis, they call them, okay, by the way, they, just, they split this egg into three as well, right? The, the Swag Lokas, the heavens, the Bu Lokas, the middle realm, and the Bata Lokas, the Halish realms, okay? So now we've got seven on top. What are the seven below? The seven below are the first part of inner earth. So remember we said there are two parts of inner earth. Gaia, mother earth, had two children, Prometheus and Epimetheus, okay? So... Atala Loka is the first part of inner earth. I think this is where all the tunnels are. This is, I'll explain that in a second anyway. The next realm would be the Vitala Loka, okay? That's the next hellish realm. Below that, you've got the Sutala Loka, which is the great deep in the Gabadoka Ocean, the great ocean, the turtle. We always see it depicted in, um, in, in, in many ancient depictions of the earth, the flat earth, sitting on a turtle. This is the turtle. This is what that means. The turtle is the great ocean below us that the earth is sitting on. It's not a, an actual turtle, like people say. It's the great ocean. Below that, we've got the four hellish realms. The Talatala Loka, the Mahatala Loka, the Rasatala Loka, and the Patala Loka. And then you've got Shiva in hell, so to speak. Okay, so that's the seven hellish realms. Seven heavenly realms, seven hellish realms. So the Vedic scriptures go into a lot of detail. They even go into figures, how big this Bumandala is. They say it's 8 billion miles across, or billion, 8 billion kilometers across, okay? They, 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 they give so much detail um, for those who want to read into that and, and study that. Let's look at what the Norse said about the universe, okay? So the Norse also divided it into three. They've got Valhalla or Asgard, which are the heavenly realms. Okay, they've got Midgard, Middle Garden, this is where we are, okay, and then they've got Helem, which is the hellish realms below us, okay, 
So they've got Valhalla, where Thor is, where Odin is, sorry, the boat of Odin, okay? You've got Gimle, the three realms, Gimle, Valhalla, and Himinborg. These are the three heavens that they talk about, these three up here. The fourth one being the boat of Odin, okay? And then you've got the Alphahim realm, okay? Alphahim, um, I think they called it the realm of um, the little elves. Little elves referring to the stars, because that's what they saw. When they saw the lights in the, in the sky, they called them the little elves. This is Alphaim, okay? They named, and of course, you've got the Bifrost Bridge, okay? As in the Cosmic Highway, Bifrost Bridge, self-explanatory, right? They named all the planets. They named Saturn, Woden, Jupiter, Frigg. These were named after gods. Um, Mars, Tyre, um, Venus, Freya. Um, the sun, Suna, our sun, our moon, money, okay? And then they named um, Mercury, Hermod, who was also a god of uh, a messenger of some sort. Again, that is very important. That messenger is very important. Of course, these all had their roles. The most common ones are obviously the messenger and Saturn, time. Saturn's always associated with time, father time. And I'll explain exactly why that is in a minute as well, okay? The Norse also described these lands in great detail, okay? They called this whole part Midgard, the Middle Garden, but they also called the Crater Continent, I'll show you. They also called the Crater Continent at the center, Midgard, the Middle Garden, right in the center. Okay, so where Eden, where Shambhala is, that's Midgard, okay, as you can see, right? Below that, they called Inner Earth, inside the Pyramid of Mandala, um, the realm of the Svatilam, okay? Svatilam, meaning realm of um, stone spirits or dark spirits. I'm sure you can decipher what that means yourselves, okay? And then you've got Aiga, which is the great deep, mother of the great deep, mother of the great oceans. And then you've got the realm of Loki, the bad guy, right? Loki at the bottom, Helen, right? So these Nordics, the Norse, they describe these lands in very great detail. Midgard at the center, the middle garden, naturally, okay? This is Vanayam, the land of the Vanir. Vanir referring to children of God, okay? The gods in, 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 um, in, in Asgard at the top, were called the Acer gods, the gods of the gods. The gods where we are, the Veneer, were children of the Acer gods. So they considered the beings that live here to be children of the Acer gods, of the gods of the gods, Vanahem. It's interesting because where I come from in Africa, in Zimbabwe, the Shona word for children is Vana. So I was trying to decipher what Vanahem was. I couldn't, I, I couldn't figure it out. Okay, so I used etymology, again, something that I've learned from Santos and syncretism. And I connected the dots. Well, Veneer, Vana, children, Veneer, were children of the gods. Vanahem, land of the children, uh, land of the children of gods, Vanahem. And that's how I came to that conclusion. They then tell us there's a place called the Nephilim, okay? The realm of frost and ice, Okay. This is the Nephilim, the ice wall. This is what they call the Nephilim, okay? And beyond that is where the Jutoinim live. Beyond the Nephilim is the land of the Jutoinim, the frost and ice giants, so they call them. So we see in a lot of mythology, they talk about the Nephilim, fallen angels, right? In the Bible, it talks about the Nephilim, fallen angels, right? Well, you can connect the dots yourself you know, how that's all linking with the Bible. Norse mythology and the Bible connecting right there. Beyond that, they say there is the Muspalem, okay? Muspalem, the land of the fire giants or the fire demons, whatever that means, okay? So you've got Midgard, Vanayam, the Nephilim, Ice Wall, Jutoinim, beyond the Nephilim, and Muspalem, okay? Underneath that is where you've got Svatilim, like I said earlier on. The realm of the stone giants, okay, or the dark giants, oh, not stone giants, the stone dwarfs or dark spirits, inner earth, okay. This is where maybe you, you get a lot of conspiracy theorists or alternative researchers who talk about 
um, the reptilians, perhaps this is where they come from, these reptilians that we, we're always talking about, from inner earth, inside the Bumandala, or possibly from the great deep, who knows, right? Doesn't really matter at this point. Okay? Um, I could do the same thing with, um, with Norse, or with, uh, with the Greek. I syncretized the Greek as well. The Greek, you know, Uranus, like I said, Uranus. Uranus was married to Gaia, right? You've got um, Zeus at the top. You've got Hera, who was Zeus's um, wife. So that's the next round. You've got Poseidon. You've got um, Polos, which is the North Star, and Zeus. They named the planets. They named this the Ether, by the way. Actually, they actually named it the Ether, right? Um, they named the planets. Saturn was Kronos. Um, Jupiter was named after Zeus. So Jupiter is Zeus as well. Um, Mars is Aries. Um, Venus is Aphrodite. Um, our sun was Apollo. Our moon was Artemis. And then you've got Hermes, the messenger, again, at the center. Kronos for the time. Hermes the messenger, okay? Cronus is first, time. Hermes is the last one, the messenger. All of these also had their own different roles and their own different things, okay? Then you've got Mother Gaia with the two children, Prometheus and Epimetheus, okay? And then at the top, you've got Atlantis. This top bit is Atlantis, the concentric rings of Atlantis. The center, as you notice, is a crater continent now, okay? This is the sunken continent of Atlantis. This is where that myth, myth comes of the sunken continent. Remember earlier on I said, I think there was a capstone, okay? I think this land was not always a crater, but something happened for it to become a crater. It was actually above, so it was a proper pyramid. Interestingly enough, if you look at the pyramids in Egypt, yeah, the Great Pyramid in Egypt, it's missing the capstone at the top. I think that's symbolical. The ancients were trying to tell us something, okay? So if you go to Egypt and you look at the, 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 the biggest pyramid, I forgot what it's called, the capstone is missing. On our pyramid, on the earth, the capstone is also missing. Okay? Interesting. It's now a crater. So they were telling us something there, right? Back to this, okay? And then you've got Pontus, below Mother Gaia. You've got Pontus, who was the keeper of the seas. And then you've got Hades. Right? In Tartarus. They call Tartarus hell. And Hades resides in Tartarus. Okay? So that's Greek mythology. Right? And then the chaos on the outside. You could do the same thing with the Egyptians. Okay? Right? The Egyptians. You've got Amun at the top. Right? Amen. Amun. God at the top. The creator. Right? You've got Neith. His wife. You've got Hathor. You've got Newt. Who's married to Gaia. Okay? The husband of Mother Geb, uh, not Gaia, Mother Geb. So Geb and Newt are husband and wife. The firmament above us and the earth below us. Okay. They also named all the stars, um, all the wandering stars. Okay. Saturn. Now this is quite controversial. This is just my own secret. This is not confirmed. This was just me coming up, trying to decipher it myself. It could be wrong. If someone can correct me, that'd be great. But I think Osiris is Saturn. That's Osiris. Okay. Isis is Jupiter, okay? Hedeshur, for sure I know, is Mars. Sekhmet, again, for sure I know, is Venus. Ra, for sure I know, is our sun. Our sun, Ra. I think everyone knows that. And Konsu is the moon, okay? And then you've got Toth, for sure I know, again, messenger, okay? And then you've got Horus, the god Horus, keeper of the winds. Which winds? These winds. Toroidal field, uh, um, the, the, the toroidal fields around the earth. These are the winds. So when they say this is the keeper of the winds, these are the winds that it's keeping. Okay? By the way, you read in the Bible and in other scriptures, they talk about the four corners of the earth. These are the four corners of the earth. Okay? The four rounds are the four corners. The four winds. They talk about the four winds in the Bible. Which are the four winds? The four Taurus fields. These are the four winds talked about in the Bible. Okay? And then below that, the Egyptians, the Kemetic Egyptians, um, they called the great deep mother Sobek. Sobek, the keeper of the waters. Okay? And then you've got Atum, the tomb, right? At the bottom. Okay? And that is Kemetic Greek 
universe inside the cosmic egg. Okay? Right. So, let's move on to the next bit. Okay, we've established. Okay. Let's talk about the ages, okay? In, um, particularly in the Indian cultures, they talk about the four ages, okay? The, these are ages of consciousness. So everything is cyclical in life. You know, there are peaks and troughs. There are times when consciousness is up and there are times when consciousness is down. For all the beings that live on the Bumandala, there are different beings, different races, different nationalities, um, all along this Bumandala, okay? So this is what we might call aliens beyond our ice wall. We might call these aliens, uh, but they are beings just like we are beings here. And they will call us aliens as well. So aliens do exist and outer space does exist, but it's not like we've been told or, 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 or you know, that, that it's on, on the planets, it's on the lands beyond, okay? So this is really important, really, really important. I need to explain this, the ages. Okay, so the Indians talk about the four ages, okay, the Kali Yuga, the Twapara Yuga, the Tetra Yuga, and the Satya Yuga, right? The bronze, no, the iron, the bronze, the silver, and the golden age. These are ages of consciousness, okay? These ages are determined by many things. They're determined by the constellations above us, right? In Greek mythology, these would be the gods. Everything above in these realms, these are the gods and goddesses that look after us, the big brothers and big sisters, okay? The suns and the moons that revolve around us, these were called the Olympians. Olympians. These are the demigods that look after us subconsciously, okay? They determine the ages. And we, on the earth, on the Bumandala, we are all the titans, okay? The soldiers that are living out the whole script of the whole thing. So all of this is, is a stage, okay? We are on the main stage. We are the, you know, we're on the stage of creation on the Bumandala, okay? And these are the directors, if you want to think of it in movie terms. These are the ones directing the scripts and the programs, right? There is free will, I'm, I'm saying that, but don't think that we don't have free will. We do have free will, but on a grand scheme, there is a script within that narrative. Otherwise, you'd just be crazy to be chaotic. There has to be a cycle. There has to be order to all of this. None of this is just random and chaotic. There's an order. There's a cycle. There's a, a system to all of it. Okay? So, interesting enough, I noticed something very, um, very interesting, right? These toroidal fields, the vanillin belts that are around all the earths, okay? These are constantly growing, expanding, and contracting, okay? This is what creates our ages. In, um, in, in, the, in the Vedic scriptures, they talk about a 26,000 year cycle of consciousness. Every 26,000 years, we shift um, within that 26,000 years from the iron to the golden age. So every 6,400 and whatever years, we go from one age into another. Okay, and even within that, there are ages, which are what we call the, um, um, the, the zodiacal ages, the age of Aquarius, the age of Aries, the age of, um, you know, all the zodiac constellations. And those are all conscious ages. So there are smaller ages within bigger ages within bigger ages. Okay, so everything is cyclical. Okay, so there's a 26,000 year cycle. And then within that, there's a 6,400 year cycle. Within that, there's a 2,100 year cycle. Okay, we've just come out of the age of Pisces, which was the whole Jesus thing, fish, Pisces. We're now going into the age of Aquarius, the water bearer. Okay, Aquarius is technology. Aquarius is um, coming together. Aquarius is the mixing, mixing water. Aquarius is always a, a man or a woman pouring water, pitcher of water, mixing the waters. This is now where things are now being mixed. Um, knowledge is coming out, technology. This is the age of Aquarius, okay? This is where we are now, right? So these toroidal fields, the Van Allen belts, the aurora borealis and all that, 
they have a significance in that. So we are at a very, very um, special point at the moment, right? Because we're shifting, we're now getting, we're approaching a 6,100 year, 6,400 year cycle shift, which also coincides with the 2,100 year cycle. So not only are we shifting um, consciously, like we did in the last shift during the age of Jesus or Pisces, we're now shifting physically. Like I said, these toroidal fields are expanding and contracting. During the golden age, there are no toroidal fields inside our universe. Okay, let me find a proper one. Just so we can see it properly. Okay, there are no torus fields in our universe in the golden age. Everything's connected. We are at the peak of consciousness everywhere in the universe. Yeah, it's the golden egg. Okay, all these toroidal fields expand outwards over time. It's almost like the cosmic egg is breathing in and out. The womb of creation breathes in and breathes out, breathes in and breathes out. And these toroidal fields follow that breath created by the axis mundi. Okay, so when God, okay, is breathing in, okay, Brahma, this is when the torus fields are spreading out. This is over thousands of years. And breathing in, the Taurus fields close again. We're now in the Dark Age. Out and in. At the moment, we are ascending. We're on the upward cycle. Okay? So the Taurus fields are expanding. This is what is causing this conscious awakening that is happening at the moment. This is why we are consciously waking up at the moment. Because we are picking up the frequencies, okay, of this toroidal field at the center. The aurora Borealis coming from the messenger, okay, the demigod Mercury, Hermes, Toth, Buddha, at the center. Remember, everything's inter interlinked. They tell us, mainstream science, at the center, in the magnetosphere at the North Pole, there is an electromagnetic field that's being affected by the sun. Which sun? This sun, the black sun, black sun of intent, <laughs> Rahu. This is it at the center. So the frequencies we're picking up subconsciously that are creating this awakening that we're all talking about, the vegan movement, um, the flat earth movement, uh, people just questioning government, you know, what's happening with Trump, with everything, all this craziness. People are now becoming more aware. Before we never questioned, we just followed whatever we're told by governments. Now we are questioning things a lot more. Why? We're getting more intelligent. We're waking up. What's waking us up? It's this energy that is growing out of Eden, out of this Taurus field, and heading towards the outer bits. So we're heading towards the Golden Age. We're now coming out of the Dark Age. In the Dark Age, all of them are closed in. As we head towards the Golden Age, they open up, open up, open up, until they are assimilated into the outermost, into the egg. And, there, and there's nothing. And then everything grows back again, and we descend back into the dark ages of consciousness. Everything is closed off again, including our minds, physically and metaphysically, spiritually and mentally. Okay? So, likewise, the toroidal field around, um, around where we are, around here, is also spreading outwards. It's also opening up. Okay? So you hear NASA, they were telling us, or, or, or mainstream science, for a long time, they were worried about the ozone layer opening at the North Pole, okay? Which would bring an end, um, which, which would be the end of the world, which would destroy the world, the ozone layer. Well, there's some truth in that. The ozone layer is this torus field growing out. And it will destroy the world, but not physically, metaphysically, to destroy the paradigm. A new age will come in. That's, that's the apocalypse they're worried about. Their paradigm, these elites that run the world, they're worried that their age of ruling over the masses will end and it is ending because people are waking up we're questioning now right we're not just following we're now researching and thinking for ourselves okay because the ozone layer is opening up okay this tourist field is growing at the center and we are picking up the frequencies well most of us some of us not everyone will this happens really slowly okay there's a process to it it can't happen in an instant that has to happen slowly and gradually some will pick this up 
um, a lot quicker than others. Some are waking up quicker than others. Some need time. Some won't wake up. Some will die asleep. And that's fine. And they'll reincarnate. And they might wake up in the next reincarnation. Okay? And likewise. So this outer field is also expanding. Okay? The Van Allen belt. They're telling us that very soon they'll be able to leave the Van Allen belt. They're very excited about going to Mars. They were saying that we can't leave the Van Allen belt. But soon humans will be able to leave the Van Allen belt. Okay? And that's because the frequency is changing. A and B, the Van Allen belt is growing outwards as well. Okay? So there'd be holes in this ozone layer as well. Right? So this is a very special time for, for, for everyone on this Bumandala. I think the people out here or the beings out here, they're also having their own conscious shift of some sort. Right? Some of them uh, will probably be getting ready to come in, the good ones, and the bad ones will be getting ready to go outwards. Because in is always good. You want to go in and up rather than out and down, which I'll explain in, in, in the next video. Okay? So this is what's happening. This is the conscious shift that is currently taking place. Right? We need to be picking up these frequencies and we need to be aware of what's happening. Okay? In the Bible, by the way, it talks about the North Star. There's the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. Right? And the three kings were told that when you see the North Star in the sky, that is where, that is what you should follow. Follow the North Star. And that North Star will lead you to where Christ is, where Christ is being born. Okay? So that story is, is an allegory of what's happening now. Right? Our ancestors, or we, were trying to tell our future selves something. Because we've all reincarnated thousands of times. So our ancestors are us. Okay? The North Star, in this case is the messenger, the messenger of God, Buddha, Hermes. Okay, when you see the North Star in the sky, follow Christ, Christ consciousness at the center. This is where Christ is being born, right? So eventually this whole thing will be golden age, but it starts from the center, okay? It's spreading from the center outwards. So those who are not in this frequency, are not in this journey, they will run away from this frequency, okay? They want to go as far away from it. These elites, they want to go to Mars, they're running away from this divine frequency because they are not, it's not their soul path, it's not their journey. And I'll talk about that in the next video. Okay? Those of us who are ascending, who are on the way up on the cycle, we are picking up these frequencies and we are being drawn to there. Some are not being drawn anywhere. They're not feeling any of this. They are meant to carry on playing the game on this stage here. They've not learnt enough. They're not ready to move on either way, in or out right? They are meant to carry on the paradigm here, the new world order here. Okay? The new age. Okay? And hopefully it will be a good one. And I think it will because we're ascending consciously. Right? Right. Next, I want to talk about reincarnation and the cycle of life. Okay? So this is now more metaphysical. Okay? I can't prove any of this. I'm not saying it's absolutely true. But this is my inner standing and perspective um, based on what I've researched um, and what I, what I feel, my knowledge. And, and, you know, it could be wrong. If people can correct me, that's fine. If people resonate with it, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Okay? So, remember earlier on I said that um, we're all stars. Everything is a star. And we are all um, reflections of God. Every single one of us. Everything that is conscious is a fragment of the whole. The whole being Brahma at the top, okay? God. So we are drops in the ocean of consciousness, okay? So in the beginning was the Holy Trinity at the top, okay? And they birthed many, many souls, including you and me um, right now, okay? We are souls birthed out of the whole, out of God. Tells us in the Bible, God breathed air into Adam, right? So that air is consciousness, okay? That is what consciousness is. The Holy Spirit, that is what we are. We are Holy Spirits. Everything is a star. All is a tomb. All is a moon, as um, Santos always says. So, this is where we were. Remember, we're talking about the different realms, the 14 different realms that the, the Vedics talk about, okay? And this is where the cycle of life happens. And this is how the cycle of life happens. So, first, you're one of the whole. You're there born or created 
as a soul, individual soul, you then become a fallen angel. So you experience independentness for the first time in this top realm, which is... Uh, let me get this correct. Okay? Which, in, which is the Tapaloka in Vedic cosmology. This is where you experience your first life as uh, a, a, a single soul, as an individual soul, right? You then go into the Yanaloka, right? You become a fallen angel again, right? You then go into the Mahaloka, you're a fallen angel again. And all this time, you're falling in consciousness as well, okay? So the further you are from source, the further down your consciousness is falling, okay? Right? And up here, you're still in the heavens. You're still an angel, but you're becoming a fallen angel, like it says in the Bible, okay? Once you leave the Mahaloka, the stars, once you leave the skies, you're no longer an angel now. You're now in time. This is where time comes in. Kronos, Saturn, Father Time, Sane Suru, Father Time. This is the first place you incarnate into. You incarnate into the planet Saturn. You then become a demigod, right? As the um, Greeks put it, right? You're now influencing, yeah? You're now a director, uh, you know, of, of the Titans. We are the Titans on Earth, okay? So you do your time in there. You then reincarnate down to the next sun, which is um, Mars, okay? You're now influencing the beings on, on those lands where Mars is. And then you incarnate into the next one, which is our sun, Apollo. You're influencing the beings where we are. So right now in the sun, there are beings that are influencing us. So you hear this movement about people saying, I'm sun gazing. Okay, I look up in the sun and I sun gaze and I, and I, and I meditate and whatever. That's because you're communicating with the beings right now, the souls in the sun, subconsciously. That is what prayer is. That is what meditation is. You are trying to connect with souls in all these other realms, mainly in the suns. Okay? From the sun, your next incarnation is into Buddha, Hemrod, into uh, Mercury. Okay? You're now a messenger. Okay? You're getting ready to deliver the message from the demigods to the titans. Okay? At this point, um, you're now maybe at 65% consciousness. Okay? You're now ready to descend into the physical. Right? And once you're in the physical, this is when you forget now. This is where we will now have um, the amnesia. Because now you're, you're on the stage of creation. You're now truly an actor, acting out um, the directives and the, the ages and everything else. You're now experiencing your own simulation, as well as the collective one of wherever you are. So your first incarnation is into um, Shambhala, Eden. This is where you first become a fallen angel. You do your time in there, right? And after a while, you either reincarnate, or sometimes physically, depending on the ages, but mostly you reincarnate into where we are, okay? And you now become a human being like we are now, okay? So these elites that are ruling us, these are fallen angels, and I think some of them are also beings from the underworld that are influencing us at the moment in the dark age, for now. So these fallen angels, some of these elites that are ruling us, okay? This is why they've been a lot more intelligent than most of us for a while, okay? Because they're fallen angels. They're coming from the center going outwards, okay? Right? And we are going the other way. But the scales are balancing, right? We're getting to a stage where we're going to be balancing the scales very soon. Well, we are already. We're catching up. They are falling in consciousness. We are rising in consciousness, the rest of us, most of us, the good ones, okay? So once you've done your time here, you reincarnate many times through the moon, okay? The moons are, are processing centers or reincarnation realms where when your soul dies, you go into the moons, you, you assess yourself. No one judges you. You're not judged by anyone. You assess yourself and you come back and you work out your karma or whatever you need to work out. Because remember, the meaning of life is birth, experience, growth, and move on. So if you haven't learned enough and you haven't grown enough, you must come back down and play again. Work out your karma and learn as much as you can before you can move on to the next stage. Okay? These beings, because they're fallen angels, okay, they automatically will be drawn 
to the worlds outside. Okay, because they're going outwards and downwards. This is why these elites, right, the governments, they're obsessed with going to Mars, the outer lands. They're going outwards. Okay, they're on their way out and down. Right? Right, these worlds are not necessarily hellish, as in hell, hell. I don't think so. But I think they are disconnected from nature and from source. There's a difference between intelligence and intellect. So there might be a lot of um, uh, intellect out here, technology, you know, cities with amazing technology out here, but not so much knowledge, gnosis, okay? They're disconnected from nature and from things of trans, trans, uh, transcendental things, spiritual things. They're, everything out here is very artificial, which is what you're seeing at the moment. They're preparing us. Everything is becoming very artificial, robots, food, money, everything is becoming more and more artificial. Okay, there's this big AI movement happening at the moment. So the beings on the way down are attracted to these things, these artificial things. Okay, I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying that is your soul path or their soul paths. And then after that, your next stage will be the outer lands. Okay, Muspelem, the fire giants, whatever that means, according to the Norse. After that, 40%, you're now in inner earth. You're now a reptilian, so to speak, inside the first part of the Bumandala. Okay? I think the underside of the Bumandala, I don't think this is a physical place you can go. This is where you reincarnate as a spirit again. You're now a spirit. You don't have a physical body. But you're a dark spirit now. Okay? Now you're a devil. You're a Shiva. You're a destroyer. Up here, you're a creator. Down here, you're a destroyer. So you are trying to gravitate people right? You're influencing people up here as well, subconsciously, right? When they say that the devil has influenced you, these are the beings, the, the beings out in these worlds down here, trying to subconsciously influence you. All your bad thoughts, all your negative thoughts are coming from the frequencies from these beings under here. You then get to 30%, 25%, 20%, 15%, 10%, you know, there's hardly any light left in you, okay? You are now truly, uh, you know, a fallen angel in, in, in the truest sense of the word, okay? But then you work your way back up again. Once you're down here, right, the cycle of life, you can't be here forever. You've got to come back up again. But this is all happening over millions or thousands of years or whatever, okay? You then come back up again, 15, you are ascending. You're now becoming a shooting star. You're shooting back upwards, okay? You go through all the different rounds again, the reverse, you're here, then you're here, and then you incarnate where we are, okay? And then you get to the center. So those of us who are being drawn to, to goodness, to love, to, 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 um, to truth, right? Those of us who are trying to change things for the better, okay? We are shooting stars. We are ascending, right? On the cycle of life. We're on our way up. And we're meeting in the middle with those descending. So you've got the good guys and the bad guys. And this is necessary for the cycle of life. This is duality. This is polarity. Good and bad. It has to happen. Fallen angels and shooting stars. Okay. Now remember, I put the suns on this side and the moons on this side. I did that deliberately. Okay. Except for that one. That one is a sun and the moon. Okay. So when you're ascending, when you're way out, the moons, the mothers... Our portals out, the suns are gateways in. So those descending come through the sun, those ascending go through the moon. Okay? Males inseminate, females give birth. Okay? If you can see, this looks like a brain, the cosmic egg, with the center of the right. You've got the left hand path, male principles, right hand path, female principles. Okay? This is where all that esoteric stuff comes in. For those who are not afraid to, um, to research that and to try and understand it. Okay? So this is where you come out on the, on, from the moon side. So you incarnate here, or you, in this case, we're going through a very special time. We can actually physically walk into the Garden of Eden. Okay? But we have to pick up these frequencies for those who want to make the pilgrimage. Not everyone um, will want to do this or can do this. But those who are ready to ascend, those who have learnt everything they need to learn, right? At the center, here where we are, 
there are those who are ready to move on to the next stage of life. Some need to incarnate, like I was saying, a few more times before they can move on. Okay? Others are ready to move on to the garden, to the center, to the next stage. I've done my time here. I feel like I need to move on. Okay? I need, I need something new. I need a new experience. So this is where veganism comes in, or vegetarianism. This is where um, truth, love, and all those things come in, the garden. Disconnecting from artificial, trying to connect with nature, sun gazing, um, loving animals, and nature, and all that. You're preparing yourself for the garden. You have to prepare yourself. Because if you don't, you cannot be able to withstand the frequencies here. Because the frequencies in this dimension are much, much, much higher. Okay? So if you want to make the physical pilgrimage here, you need to be prepared. Okay? Because if you don't, you will just get your body and your soul will not, you know, you will get zapped and you'll just reincarnate back here again. Back to square one. You'll die on your way there. Okay? Because the Van Allen belt, the frequencies there, you will not be able to withstand them. So those of us, you hear me talking a lot about this pilgrimage to the North Pole. Follow the North Star when the time is right. I'm going to make a little prediction. I know they, should, they say you should never put dates or make prophecies, but I am. I'm going to say Vision 2020. 2020, I think this Aurora Borealis or Van Allen belt will be high enough for us to see the North Star for us to see Mercury. This is planet X that they talk about. This is planet Nibiru, they say that comes around every 26,000 years to destroy the world. This is it. But it's not a physical destruction, it's a metaphysical destruction, a new age. Okay? So when the time comes, and I think 2020, those who see the North Star and want to make the pilgrimage, not everyone, okay? If you don't want to, um, you don't have to. Your next incarnation could be in there. You can stay here and, and, and stay for a bit longer. And when you ascend or when your body dies, your soul can ascend into there and reincarnate into there. But I certainly feel like I want to make a physical pilgrimage when the time is right. Okay, when the time is right, we will make a mass pilgrimage. And we'll know. It also says in the Bible that Christ will come like a thief in the night. Okay, what's Christ? Christ is the energy, Christ consciousness, the energy coming from this toroidal field at the center, from the messenger of God. That's Christ. That's coming like a thief in the night. I had my awakening last year, right? Overnight, like most people. One day I was on a spinning ball, I was eating meat, I was, you know, following money. Something happened to me, my life changed. Uh, I realized where we are. We're not on a spinning ball. Um, I changed my eating habits, etc., etc. My life changed. I became a better person. Okay? Christ got me. Christ consciousness came to me like a thief in the night. I wasn't expecting it, and it just happened. And I'm sure many watching this now have had a very similar experience. Okay? So this is where we are. Right? So, once you're there, you live out your life in the Garden of Eden. Okay? This is a very natural place. There's no technology. Well, there is technology, but it's more of a, a natural technology. It's a different type of technology. It's not artificial. Okay, nature has got magic. Magic exists, believe it or not, but I won't go into that now. It does exist. So the technology out here is a magical type of technology. It's not artificial like out here. Okay? So this place is not um, just sitting and gardening and doing nothing. There's a lot going on there. It's a beautiful place, the Garden of Eden, okay? But you must be at the right frequencies. There's, there's, no la there's no hate there. There's no bad frequencies. Well, there is, but there is less. There's less duality there, okay? It's not, it's not completely heaven, obviously, um, but it's the it's, it's, it's closest thing we can get on earth to heaven, heaven on earth, the closest thing, okay? And this is where myself and many are being drawn to go. Some are not ready. Okay, this is the middle ground. This is half artificial, half Garden of Eden. You're in the middle of the two worlds. Middle of nature and technology. Artificial technology, natural technology. The middle. We're stuck in the middle. So some are being drawn to this artificial technology. Others are being drawn to nature and natural technology. Okay? And some are not ready to go either way. 
they will stay and enjoy life here on earth for a bit more and experience and change and help with the ages eventually all of this will be heaven on earth when all the toroidal fields are are completely spread out and you know and one with with, with the main one this is when it's heaven on earth this is when we're in the in the satya yuga in the golden age but this will happen really 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 slowly so you can see the shift you can feel the shift you can see what's happening right now with world governments with world economies with uh, people questioning you know there's a lot of turmoil going on everything must um you know before there's a new birth the old must die so it's going to be a very painful process over the next few years a lot of things that seem negative will happen a lot of bad things that we might think are bad will happen but they have to happen because the old has to die for the new to begin okay because we're getting into a new age now and these elites they know this okay and they are shaking in their boots because we're catching up we're waking up and their consciousness they're getting dumber we're getting smarter okay this is why they are trying to destroy everything before they go because they they have to go they have to go they cannot withstand this frequency this frequency is hurting them this energy being sent from the center is not good for them they do not like it this is why they're trying to destroy europe you see this whole agenda in in europe with the whole uh immigration divide and conquer black versus white immigrants versus not immigrants etc etc they're doing that on purpose divide and conquer because they don't want to destroy everything here before they leave you know if we can't have it we want to burn it before we go and then you can stay behind and rebuild it on your own that is the agenda ultimately and they'll go out to mars running away and and eventually they'll be pushed so much out because they're on their way down and only the good ones the ones ascending will be here during the golden age okay so going back to the cycle of life once you get to um, ascend into the messenger when you're a demigod you get into the moon you get into venus you do jupiter you know you're doing your time in all of those you're raising in consciousness and then after that you become an angel again right you're a shooting star here now you're an angel again you're at 85 percent you're ascending okay now you're influencing things up here you're a director of everything you then ascend into there 90 95 and then after that you don't become one of the whole now you are free you exit the cosmic egg through um, uh, the cosmic highway out into the multiverse you're now free to um, explore and experience life in other cosmic eggs in other experiences in other worlds in other universes okay as a free soul you are free forever you will never die right you go into another cosmic egg and you have your own experiences in there that are probably totally different to this right and this is the cycle of life and new souls will be being, being birthed they do the cycle they go out they ex and this is continuously happening cycles of life of consciousness of stars that is what we truly are we are stars wrapped in skin and flesh and bone soul spirit and even science quantum science is starting to to realize this now they're starting to 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 tell us that we're not just uh, flesh and bones there's a lot more going on and it's obvious to most people now i think those who are awake know for sure okay and that is the cycle of life okay i hope i was clear and I hope I wasn't going around in circles. Um, again, like I said, I'm not saying that everything I'm saying is 100% truth. A lot of it is my own understanding from what I've researched and from what I've learned from other people and from what I'm picking up from, um, you know, from, from the universe. Um, it's my interpretation. If you resonate with it or if you recognize it or if you re-remember it, because remember, we are all our own ancestors because we've reincarnated. So uh, this time is normally called the great remembrance because we are re-remembering things we've always known. For those who are tuning to the frequencies, you remember this stuff, this knowledge. Okay? So I feel like I'm remembering this. This feels like a distant memory to me. And I'm remembering it and I'm sharing it with you. And I'm seeing when I speak to people, a lot of people recognize and they go, oh, do you know what? This sounds familiar. This sounds, it sounds right. I don't know if it's fact, but it sounds right. Because your soul is re-remembering, you're waking up. 
So if you resonate with it and you get it, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Okay? By the way, I also think that there are souls here on earth right now, right, who um, are here to help. So perhaps they've ascended um, already a few times. There may be a few steps ahead. They may be at the moon stage or at the Venus stage or even at the Garden of Eden stage. But they chose to reincarnate and come back here to where we are to help with the shift. These are what a lot of esoteric um, circles call the starseed children or the um, indigo children. Uh, these special children that are born special in a way, I guess. So these are the children that are here to help ascend the process. There are many people on earth right now who say, I was born and I don't feel like I belong here. I don't feel like I belong in a body. I don't feel like, um, um, I, feel, I, you know, I feel like I'm here for a reason beyond just living. There's something going on from, from when they're born. There are many of these um, people here. And those, yeah, many of you listening now will recognize what I'm saying. Okay. I don't think I'm, I'm one of them personally. I, I might be because I've always had that feeling of there's something more to this. And I had my awakening at the age of 33 last year. And, you know, so, so perhaps I'm one of those souls who chose to come down and help with the ascension process, right? Perhaps, perhaps I'm, I'm on the journey, you know, I, I, I incarnated here and perhaps I've been here and I've, who knows, but I think there are many, many things happening with this incarnation. So there are some who've come directly from these outer worlds and have incarnated. These are the new souls, the young souls. They are the old souls who've incarnated many times and who've learned and learned and learned and they are now ready to move on. Um, there are other souls who've come backwards. They were already ahead. They've now come back and they want to help with the ascension and then they'll move on spiritually. So maybe they're not even meant to be going to the center at all in physical form. Maybe when they ascend, they are ascending upwards into the moons or, or whatever, spiritually. They're not going to be reincarnating into body in the next in the next life. Okay, so many things going. Personally, I think um, I'm destined for the center. Okay, um, I still want to experience life in a physical body, uh, but certainly not in the conditions we're in now. I'm certainly drawn to uh, nature and um, you know, living in harmony with the animals, with nature and veganism and love and cop and, and all those things. Um, I'm not drawn to technology and, and, you know, the materialistic things in life. There's nothing wrong with those things. You know, those who enjoy them, enjoy them. That's fine. Um, but there are many of us who feel more drawn to nature and to, to, to that side of things. Okay. And that's my journey. So I think for, for, for sure, this is my next incarnation the center in physical form. Okay. I just wanted to put that out there. Really nice. Well done. <clears throat> that was very, very well done. Um, yeah. Uh, to explain the cosmos in under an hour, you've got to be, um, you know, you've got to have the whole concept conceptualized. You've got to have it clear and you've done that. That's brilliant. And you've um, syncretized lots and lots of different things, you know. Um, you've salvaged, you know, the heliocentric, uh, ridiculous, um, you know, explanations, but you've found the truth in what they're trying to say and how to explain it properly. Because this is what I do too. For instance, one example. Um, the atom, they tell you there are three things, the neutron, the proton, and the electron, but <clears throat> they don't understand. <laughs> there are three things, but they don't understand what those three things are because they're giving it a particle, whereas there are no particles. Yeah. You see? So, yeah. So, but, <clears throat> but you can salvage it because more or less they're aiming at the, in the right direction. Um, it's just that they're, they're never really allowed to... Um, uh, explain things completely truthfully. They're just not allowed to because then we just wake up so quickly. So look, um, that was really, really well done. Uh, I'm glad you recorded because I think you should put this up straight away. Give people this. 
This will give many people a lot of aha moments, all kinds of people. I think it will give people like the uh, concave earthers something to think about, yeah. uh, even the uh, square, diamond, rectangular earthers. Um, it's really, really going to um, give them a lot of inspiration. Now, I do have difficulty with one thing, uh, Venus. Hi guys, welcome back. Um, just want to kick off where we left off. Um, I think Santos was about to explain um, a couple of points that he's picked up on that possibly need to be looked at on this cosmic egg model. But before I continue, I also just want to thank um, Santos, really. Everything I've presented over the last two present presentations, uh, most of the work um, is stuff that I've ripped off the research Santos have, has done. So I've hardly done any research. I've, I've been watching a lot of your videos, Santos, and learning off you, and learning off the syncretism, and then doing my own bit of research to, to add on to it. But um, I just wanna give most of that credit to you, really, um, and say thank you. Yep, the floor's yeah. Thanks, Martin. I really appreciate that. Um, it's, it's good to see that uh, my hard work has gone to yeah to this outcome. It's great to see the influence that it has. Um, uh, well, what I was thinking of with your model was um, that Venus should go on the inside of the sun or where Mercury is. I'm thinking because. <clears throat> They are considered to be personal planets in astrology. You've got to take a lot of <coughs> astrology into account. So I'm thinking astrologically here <coughs> and also um, the Ptolemaic model. Okay, so Ptolemy clearly says that there's um, 10 concentric spheres. Uh, Prima mobile is the first then the crystalline sea, then the firmament, then time begins. Kronos, and then he has a sun, space begins. Jupiter, Mr. Expansion. Then Mars, action. Then the sun, Venus, Mercury, and the moon is the last sphere. So, Venus, Mercury, and Moon have all, always been considered to be um, uh, subsolar. I think that's the expression. I don't think that's the right expression. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm trying to think of... <laughs> it'll come to me. <clears throat> so, of course, we've got the plane of the Earth, and we've got... Um, so, Moon is always first, then Mercury, then Venus. And these planets are considered to be uh, what's called um, oh, the word just won't come. So, <clears throat> we've got the Sun here, then we've got Mars, Jupiter, then Saturn. Okay, so. Uh, I can see I can see what you're doing with uh, the moon. It's in with the sun in the, in the second um, sort of uh, Taurus. You've got a nested. You've got like nested four or five yep. nested Taurus fields. Okay, isn't that right? Four or five. Yep, that's right. Okay. So I would say, so you put the sun in the second one, yeah? Yep. And you put Mars and Venus in the third one. Yes, yep. Right. The Mer Venus, Mercury, Mercury. Mercury on the inner one, the, the, the one at the center inside us. Yeah. And you've got 
rightfully Saturn and Jupiter up here. Now Saturn is 29 and a half years in orbit. Moon is 29. Well, actually, let me be more specific because this is very interesting. 29.49, I believe it is. Got to check that one. Again, I'm going uh, It's late and I'm tired. <laughs> uh, 29.49, whatever that number is, this is exactly a harmonic of it or a, a, <clears throat> a fractal of it. Okay. Now, so days. So the Saturn and Moon thing, that's very interesting. I'll get back to that. But then you put the first vortex or nested torus field. Yeah. And you, and you put that at the center of the um, Mount Meru, sort of around the, the center part of the Earth, yeah? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a problem because Venus's orbit is 22, uh, 225 days, okay? Whereas Mars is six, eight, seven days, which is just under two years. Jupiter's 12 years, of course. <clears throat> and the sun, of course, is the one year, right? Yeah. So it's expressive of sort of a uh, golden ratio, uh, sacred geometric, um, you know, um, ratio of these these planets, right? Yeah. Order, <laughs> order. So obviously the moon goes up here with the sun. Yeah. First of all, we get Venus transits, Mercury transits, and Moon transits. Right. Called eclipses. Uh -huh. So Mercury, Moon transits are called eclipses, but they are transits because <clears throat> the eclipses can only happen near the not nodes the north node and the south node so they are eclipses they are um, um transits it's a transit mm -hmm. the moon is passing either in front of the sun or behind the sun and the north node is there but three things have to come together either rahu and ketu or north well we, as we call them in in western system um <clears throat> North Node and South Node, uh, they are always there present within four degrees of the Sun and the Moon, either or, whether it's a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, time and time again, consistently, invariably, always. So with <clears throat> Mercury, we can see the transits of Mercury, and they always happen in Taurus, in the middle of um, May in Taurus, and opposite in the middle of Scorpio, around about November 11th. So May 8th, 9th, 10th, November 8th, 9th, 10th, directly opposite. And the Venus transits happen in Gemini and opposite Sagittarius. So December 10th and Gemini and June, say 10th, uh, yeah, June the 10th or 9th, I think it happened in 2012 and 2005. Venus, both transits were in Gemini, okay, around the 5th of June to the 8th of June. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the big boys, <clears throat> they, <clears throat> we don't see these transits. So, you can see how these guys definitely, Mars belongs to that sphere, <clears throat> and Jupiter and Saturn belong to this fourth nested uh, vortex or or there could be just straight out seven of them and um, and um, well, th this is this is why Santos I was saying on my um, on my mod this is why I was saying that perhaps the the suns or what I call the sun Saturn Mars Apollo they follow, um, they run along the actual uh, vortex. Whereas the moons, they are in between. They're in an, an imaginary, um, on an imaginary path. 
they're not on the actual um, what is it called the actual the actual vortex they're in between so if we were to um, conjunct them right I don't know if, if, if it's if it's on me at the moment the screen yeah I can, yes it is I can see you okay so if we were to conjunct all these planets with Polaris like that yeah they would fold into each other all the different planets so then you'd have mercury moon sun or or mercury moon venus so maybe venus on its path is actually below the zenith of where the sun would be at its at its at its zenith at its peak if everything is conjunct <clears throat> if everything was conjunct there it would be mercury moon then venus then the sun above it at the top and then you'd have mars jupiter and saturn so these ones are following that line whereas these ones are actually in between they're not actually following the line they're in between the line they're on an imaginary eclipse imaginary um said that the suns and the moons behave differently um the suns are are following that actual ecliptic path on the torus fields and the moons are in the imaginary one. So there's an actual, another toroidal field that is maybe not as physical. It's more, you know, it's transparent that they follow. So if they're all conjunct along the axis and the sun is at its zenith, then the, and if you pull the moon in to where the axis is, the moon would fall slightly underneath the sun. I don't know if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. I get you. Yeah. Um, what is the reasoning for having Venus outside of the sun? H how do you? Only because I'm trying to understand if, the, if Venus was within our toroidal field, surely we should be able to see her more clearly as we see our sun and moon. The reason why we see our sun and moon so clearly is because they're within our toroidal field. So, so I, I would imagine that anything outside is why we see them as, as shimmering luminaries because we're seeing them beyond our Taurus field. It's being obstructed by the toroidal field. That's why they look like they're shimmering in water, those suns and moons. It's because of, of, you know, of that. So I, I, I try and, I'm trying to understand if, if Venus was within our toroidal field, surely we should see it a lot clearer, a lot clearly, the same as we see our sun and moon. And if, if she is, and, and we don't, then why don't we? If she's within our toroidal field, with, if she's within our atmospheres, the thermosphere or mesos or wherever, surely we should be able to see her a bit more clearly. More yep. often. Yep, I, I, I hear that. Um, I'm just, being an astrologer, <clears throat> I see Venus, Venus and Mercury are always near the sun okay so um i'll give i'll give you an example okay all right these are some famous people i've got here let me see, see if i remember who oh yeah i know who this one is <laughs> marlon brando okay arian i'm not going to do his re <laughs> i'm just uh i will one day uh, that's why i got these made but um <clears throat> you see venus and Mercury. Yep. And there's the sun. They're always near the sun. Okay. Okay. So Mercury can never be more than 28 degrees away from the sun. So he's always, um, it, can, it can only be in the sign of the sun, which in this case he's not. He's in the um, 28th degree of Pisces. And the sun is in the 12th degree of Aries. So they're still, they're still only 14 degrees apart from each other. That Mercury can only be another 14 degrees further away from the sun. Venus, 48, okay? So let's have a look at another chart. Who we got here? Elvis Presley. There's his sun. There's Mercury. There's Venus. 
again, they're always near. And look, and all the other planets, Mars is way over here, Jupiter. All right, so let's have a look at another one. Who's it? Oh, yeah, this one is. Uh, hmm. Anyway, I'll forget who it is. <laughs> but um, so there's the sun. There's Mercury, there's Venus. Venus is really, really, uh, she's an evening star. As you can see, the sun yep. has set. Yeah. So, yeah, so in this case, Venus is setting after the sun has set, obviously. So, but when she's here, <clears throat> she'll be rising in front of the sun. Yeah, at the ascendant, right? So, but but she's behind the sun now, right? So, and but that's about as far as she can be, right? Uh -huh. So, so this is the thing. I always see. Here's another. Here's another one. There's the sun. There's Mercury. Close to the sun. There's Venus, forward of the sun. In this case, more Venus was rising first because she would have been about here and the sun would have been down about there and then she's up here like that. There they are now. So she now she's forward of the sun. So, uh, But that's about as far as you'll ever see Venus. As Venus. She can only be 48 degrees uh -huh. away from the sun. So, so seeing this, what, you, what you're seeing is... Um, as the sun just keeps going like this, yeah, on the ecliptic, right ascending, yeah, on its on its um, azimuth, yeah, you see what's happened is you've got Mercury will come along like this. Well, I, I'll, I have to go slow. Sorry. So you've got sun, yeah, going, uh, and then Mercury will be doing this. Aha! Uh -huh. Ret so retrograding. Uh -huh. Retrogress, and then Venus will be doing more like this. So start over here. Yeah. Venus will be going like this. Uh -huh. Ret retrogressing. So so they're always. So you've got Sun and and Mercury will always be there, twenty eight degrees. Venus will always be forty eight. Now, that's why you've got the transits. See, so. This is why Venus really has to be <clears throat> this side of the sun, inside the sun from our perspective. Uh -huh. So is it possible that maybe Venus and the sun are both orbiting along um, our Taurus field, in our Taurus field? Because it still doesn't explain why we don't see Venus as clearly as we should. Because now what I'm seeing by what you've just said, you've just clarified something for me there. No, we'll see. When, I don't... when you show that movement of Mercury that Mercury makes, that's because Mercury at the center, obviously, has got a shorter circuit to make. Okay, so Mercury's circuit is much shorter. Hence, you'd see that movement that you're talking about, that, that retrograde movement. Because, you know, Mercury's circuit is, is so much shorter than any of the other rings because it's the smallest toroidal field. Okay, yep. it's a small ship. And the moon, if the moon is just here in between, so let's say the sun is here on this toroidal field, right? I'm putting the moon literally just after the sun. I mean, uh, Venus just after the sun, literally just behind. And maybe she's moving at a similar speed to the sun or you know, picking up and dropping off with the sun. So maybe Venus, she follows the sun quite closely as she orbits around her imaginary um, orbit, just after our toroidal field. Not as far as Mars, Mars who's actually on the chariot of the toroidal field on the outside. So Mars is further. Whereas Venus is closer to our toroidal field than the outer toroidal field. Yep. That's how I'm. So when you were showing those movements, I saw that straight away. And that, and that was an aha moment for me. Because 
if you look it up if you look at it from this perspective right you've got mars who's pretty much running along this toroidal field the outer one okay we've got the sun on our toroidal field and venus would be close to the sun if the sun is here venus is just behind the sun closer to our van allen belt than the outer one and then you've got Mercury at the center, obviously because she's at the center and her or his orbit is much smaller. Naturally, she would look like she's following the sun more because there's less, there's less of, a, of a gradient for them to make up. Because it's a smaller toroidal field. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. <clears throat> I'm. Um, I'd have to uh, sort of draw it all out and think about it and ponder it. But um, it's it's possible. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, no no one has ever been able to nut out the heavens perfectly. Yeah. Otherwise, but you're talking about it, you know. So, um, but you have to uh, thrash it out. Yeah. And put it on put it on the, the drawing board properly. Um, see, if, if, the sun, if the sun is doing, doing daily circles, then that year is not actually one loop. It's 365 loops. Yeah. How it would work. So, you'd have the North Pole and you'd have, say, <clears throat> Earth is like that. All right, so, <clears throat> so there's a the North Pole. Uh, I was supposed to do it. No, I didn't want to do it this way. Anyway, I'll, I'll keep going. So this is Cancer. Uh, equator. And Capricorn, yeah? Uh-huh. The tropics. Yep. And, of course, we've got Antarctica out here. Uh-huh. Okay, so now from, from the side, of course, what we're dealing with is if that's the Earth and this is the North Pole in the center uh -huh. and, and the sun will be doing um, something like that at Cancer yep. and something like this at Capricorn uh -huh. and then something like this at the equator. Yes. So you've got ramping up and down of the sun. Yep. But the sun is doing 365 of these. Uh-huh. So Venus, so the point is Venus Okay. So mm. Yeah, well Venus does 225. So what you what you what you've got then is you've got say on um, December twenty first, <clears throat> the sun hits the Tropic of Cancer, Capricorn, and Australia will be down here say like that, and then three months later gets to the equator. And that'll be March 21st, the equinox. Three months later, it gets to Cancer, June 21st, solstice, summer solstice. And Europe is, well, it's all on, you know, it's yep. all inside there. So you've got, all right, the northern. Then on the way back down, three months later, 
That'll be September 23rd. So equinox, solstice, solstice. Mm -hmm. so, so if the sun is out here at the Tropic of Capricorn yep. in December, and then it's over here in June at the solstice, and that's six months there, and that's six months there. So it's doing 365 of these every year and Mercury and Jupiter and Venus. Okay. Uh, okay. So Mercury and Venus. So Mercury is at the center, the North Pole. So Mercury is, is within that first ring. That's Mercury's transit in there. Mercury is here. Sun is out here. Moon is also here too, yeah? The limit of the sun, yeah? The limit uh -huh. of the sun does not go out here. See, if that's the um, <clears throat> Tropic of Capricorn and you're over here in Melbourne uh -huh. and, they, and they say that the sun is rising uh, south of east right so it's rising even more than the tropic of capricorn and the equator which would be somewhere around here actually so that's what they're saying about that but i mean i i mean we're talking we're talking about uh electromagnetic phenomena in the fourth dimension you know we've got um it's like the sun is a personal objective yeah. project, um, you know, that is operating in, in laws that we just, uh, we can't really um, comprehend. Yeah. comprehend for a start because I mean, even, even, even the quantum physicists, it is, there's nothing that they can tell you that conclusively that is a scientific fact because they're also telling you always that they're theorizing, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. So they, they have never concluded anything. I mean, Copernicus was theorizing about his revolution. He says, look, please don't take <clears throat> this as absolute fact. It's only useful <clears throat> for explaining certain phenomena, you know, which means <clears throat> from one, um, explaining the relationship between to observe movements in the, the heavens, for instance, right? So yeah. it, it explains that. He says it's useful for that, but it's, it's not a true model. Same with Newton. Newton was always stressing that it's hypothetical, what he's doing and the hypothesis and the theory and what, what if and what if, you know. So, but, um, okay, well, let's get back to this then. So we've got three objects here, Mercury, always inside the tropics he never comes out to the tropics yeah yeah never comes from there to there no okay so mercury's always around here and then you've got sun and moon this makes sense this makes sense this makes sense okay, okay to me. right but to have venus out here with mars in the third uh, Taurus field, um, yeah, nest, nested. The, oh, did you say there were four or five? Sorry, there are four in a one. What I was saying was that if if that is our Taurus field, okay, and the sun is either on it or just inside the Taurus field and running along it on the spiral like that which is why we see the sun because it's just inside or it's on it. I'm saying Venus would be just on the other side, touching it. They're pretty much almost touching, just divided by the Taurus field. So they're quite close to one another. Okay. And then the next Taurus field is here. And this is where Mars would be out here on the, on the next toroidal field. So technically Venus and Mars are in the same jurisdiction, sun and moon. But Venus is very close to Apollo. 
They're almost following the same path. They're always together because they're, they're just on the other side of our toroidal field and the sun is just on the other side. That's the affair that Apollo and um, Aphrodite are having in Greek mythology. And Mars was jealous of Aphrodite having an affair with, with Apollo. That's because they follow the same path. When in actual fact, Mars and Aphrodite should be together because they're, in, they're the sun and moon of these outer lands together. That's how I've reconciled it. Yeah, yeah, I, li I like that. I mean, uh, that's lovely. Uh, now, I, for me, I have to um, astrologically see how that works, you know. So, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course, we know <clears throat> with the heliocentric model, the year orbit of the sun, or, well, we, they say it's the Earth, of course, orbiting around the sun. So there, there is a, a one revolution, even though they say the Earth is rotating 24 hours, so 365 rotations around the Earth goes orbiting around the sun. So there is a one, you know, yeah, one revolution there, uh -huh. whereas... Whereas we're dealing with, so June, yep, September, uh huh, December, uh huh, and then it, and then it winds back in, yep. So the sun's torus field is like a breathing, expanding, compressing from tropic to tropic. So, so knowing this, it's easy. It's easier to fit venus into that outer ring yeah um, with mars it, it, it because now we see that venus is also going around daily along with the sun has to be absolutely so yeah so this 225 year a day so other cycle that's going on which we call an orbit of venus which it is not an orbit of venus yeah uh, that must have to do with uh ah uh, yeah it well it, it just has to do with where venus go, goes from evening to morning star it's just which has to retrogress yeah you know so she advances in front of the sun 48 degrees when she's direct then she retrogresses and she's behind the sun 48 degrees then she's going direct again and then she'll be uh, advancing in front of the sun 48 degrees then she'll go stationary then she has to retrogress so she's doing this in a pattern with the sun it's like a um, almost like a pendulum well, yeah, but yeah, or like an epicycle. Yeah, I was going to say that's it. Like an epicycle. Yeah. So she's also doing the same thing as the sun every day, yeah. but, but it's variable speed that she's just that's doing that. So, so as the sun's cruising along this away. Yeah. And as you said, this is a thousand miles an hour. Volume. Yeah. Give or, Give or take. take. Yeah. So Venus is outside here, not in not in this part of the vortex. She's in a, a, a second nested Taurus field. And so what she'll be doing is she'll be advancing like this. She's going faster than the sun, then she'll go stationary. The sun's always going the same pace. Yes, 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 yes always marking the same time right? yeah but venus will be going like that yep and then the sun will be here and then she'll go back here but she's not actually well yeah she is physically going back but but that's cool because because wherever the sun is she will always be around the same area you know she'll be doing this yeah following 
following the sun, more or less, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the other thing is... That's beautiful, Santos. You, That's beautiful, yeah. Well, yeah, you, the other thing is you say that um, if Venus were in our vortex, then we should see her as brilliant as the sun. I don't know about that because look at the moon. Uh, the moon's the same size as the sun, yes. Um, I think originally, yes, they, um, I mean, originally, I mean, at, at their, um, uh, I guess at their, uh, f the focal point where they uh, project onto, yeah. um, I think they're more or less all the same planets, uh, size, because... Remember the pictures of the 21st of August eclipse? Yeah. And whatever it was that passed in front of the sun, well, actually, no, the one that was the year before, the March 20 on the equinox of 2015, that eclipse happened in conjunction with K2, the south node. Right. And you saw, yeah, you saw like these little beads of condensed yes. water yep. in the in the sky, uh -huh. you know, like drops of water passing in front of the sun causing the eclipse. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, and we saw the same thing with the August 21st eclipse. Yeah. You see, you see the sun like that, and then you see, you definitely see something covering it like, like that, but from other angles, people saw something like that. Uh-huh going past the sun and as soon as it got in the center it created the eclipse yeah so, <laughs> so the sun is a source projection a source objective projection right so the center of the sun is probably just a, like a really well it'd have to be much smaller than the what the body that we see that we, that see. we come yeah huh? yeah 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 so i think they're all about that size right and then and then this this expanded disc that we see glowing and that has its limit see like the sun for me is like a condensed rainbow right the sun causes the rainbow the yeah. sun is um made up of white light which is um c incoherent white light and and <clears throat> the seven refracted colors of this of the white light of the sun which are the electromagnetic spectrum uh -huh. snow white yeah and and seven dwarves yeah um <clears throat> so that's just like a a coiled well it, they say it's a serpent yeah it's quetzalcoatl Yep. Uh, the rainbow serpent, according to the Aboriginals. Yeah. Well, that. Well, that's the rainbow, isn't it? But it's it's yeah. Yeah? yeah. So. So this, what we see here is the sun. That's an electrical effect. Yeah, it has to be. Absolutely. You like you're putting the moon in the same as the same thing as well like a projection as you were saying the moon pretty much has that same reputation as well so you know you're not actually because what you're seeing is not actually what is actually there mm -hmm. yeah exactly and it's the same with the moon because the moon is the same diameter or circumference as the sun so possibly venus um if we saw her in the same context as we see the sun it would probably appear like this as well so you're saying obviously the reason why those planets are like stars wandering stars yeah is because they all belong to the other three concentric nested Taurus fields that make up this big Anu, which is actually what the word is. Anu. 
That's what one of the words for the Taurus field, the original. So, um, and, and of course, this has got Uranus. Yeah. Of course, yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And Uranus is the firmament. We know that. Yeah. Uranus had a son and his name was Kronos. Yes. Kronos castrated his father Uranus. Uh huh. Right. Well, Kronos is 10. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just call him what he is time. Uh huh. Right. And then time beget some children that he swallowed. Uh huh. Because that's what time does. Time begets children and then they die and you can swallow it up. Yeah. Back out of the time matrix again. Well, then that's the son of um, Saturn is Jupiter or son of uh, Kronos yeah. in the Greek is, um, is Zeus. Uh -huh. so, so that would be space because good old Jupiter in astrology is what? Expansion, expansiveness. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you've got time. So this, this is, that is the Trinity. And, and Uranus, Anu, is this magnetic vortex. Um, yeah, or well, vortex. I was going to say firmament. But um, it's, uh, well, firmament is, is more, is not as general as I would call it generally. It's just, it's a, an Anu. Uh, you know, a um, multidimensional, uh -huh. electromagnetic Taurus body. Um, why I say multi-dimensional is because, well, there you've just described four dimensions, haven't you? Yeah. Um, each Taurus is a dimension. Yeah. So, so you would you'd be suggesting that Venus and Mars in that third Taurus field, yeah, that be they they are in another dimension. In fact, they are. Yeah. That's what um, Ptolemy says that. Um, uh, these, <clears throat> they are spiritual bodies and, and entirely luminous and conscious, conscious beings. So, yeah. <clears throat> wow. Well, something that I've been trying to figure out is where does Rhea come into this? Who's Rhea in Greek mythology? What, what would that be? Well, Rhea is the wife of Kronos. Yeah? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the, the mother of Zeus, Jupiter yes. Zeus, yes, which which is Jesus exactly uh -huh. who it is, and you can know this because um, <clears throat> Rhea Rhea becomes Mother Rhea Maria, uh huh, and her husband Saturn Kronos Sat becomes. Set becomes Seth becomes Seth Father Seth and Mother Rhea. So Hassan and Rhea beget a son, uh -huh. Zeus, Jupiter, Zeus, Jesus, and so it's the same story: Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, and and again. Kronos was the uh, like the foster father, wasn't he, uh -huh. of of Zeus because he didn't bring him up. Yes, it's the same story. So, 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 so Kronos. So would Rhea be the name that would 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 Rhea be the name of the the, the fourth toroidal field? Well, well, would that be the name of? Look at the name, brother. Look at the name. Uh, Rhea is. Area. Ah, right. <clears throat> She's also great. Yeah. She's also um, the, our mother who art great, who is great in heaven. She's also the bread, the cereals. Whoops. Rhea, bread. Because Time and space, uh -huh. Saturn and area, uh -huh. tempo and 
and area. Yeah. See, Jupiter fills the same. Jupiter fills the, fills the same boots as Rhea because yep. Jupiter is expansion. Yeah. It always works like that because what happens now is this is this is Grandpa, uh -huh. this is Daddy, and this is the Son, and now Zeus, Jupiter Zeus, Jesus becomes you know, um, the God of gods and the saviour of men in Christianity. But in Greek, he's the God of gods, right? Well, because um, he defeats time. He, he, ca he castrated his daddy because this guy castrated his daddy, right? So how does Jupiter do that? Well, he thwarts that power out of... He, he was the one that thwarted being swallowed by Kronos. That is amazing, Satchos, because when I was doing the whole solar ascension thing on my model, I put Saturn as the portal in for souls. When, when souls are descending into the cycle of life, the first place you come into is Saturn, like we're saying, Father Time. That's when time starts. And I yeah. said on this side, feminine energies, this, these are the portals out. So souls ascending upwards, they go through the moon, then through Venus, then through Jupiter. Jupiter is the last one in the fourth dimension before you enter the heavens. So defeating time. Jupiter, you're defeating time. You're now leaving time. And that's where that mythology comes in. When you get into Saturn, you're now in time. You're coming into time. When you're leaving Jupiter and ascending upwards, you're now defeating time. You're back into timeless form. Yeah, well, um, wow. Jupiter... <laughs> Yeah, it's Peter and Paul. You rob Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. Paul is a is Saturn. Yeah. And Peter, you Peter. You must understand this. There's this motif of Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul, and Mary, Peter, Paul, and Mary. But the Peter and Paul is Jupiter and Saturn because <clears throat> because the, because of this Trinity. Okay. Yeah. This this is the this is the beginning of everything. The origin of all things, the heavens. Uranus means heaven. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is our spiritual daddy. And then time is born of Uranus. Uh huh. And so time castrates no time, essentially, or the forever now. So time is now wanting to have three tenses instead of one tense. All right. So that's the principle of time. And then, and then because time swallows everything up, in order for things to exist without being swallowed up the instant they are born, you need the principle of Jupiter. So Jupiter is a principle. It's a universal principle. Uh -huh, okay. Just as Saturn is. It's the principle of, of spaciousness, volume. And that's why he's associated with Vulcan. Volcanoes produce volume because they are magnetic. Magna. Magnetism is totally responsible for what we call space, volume. So Jupiter is vol, can, volume, and he is space, as so is Rhea. You have to look at the roots of the words and you've got to know the archetypes. It's always these two twins or trinities. It's always, always tightly connected to a trinity or a duality, twins. Okay? So, um, yeah, so one is, one is uh, a malefic, Saturn, greater malefic, because time, we have to defeat time, man. We've, yeah. got to go into, yeah, we've got to go into the eternal forever now rather than being lost in the past and anxious about the future. Yeah. And never settled in the now. Why don't we just eliminate all that regret of the past, anxiety for the future, and discombobulation of not knowing who we are, why we are, where we are, ever in the now. We can get rid of all of that by reabsorbing these principles of time and space because, see this, <clears throat> all of this is frequency, yeah? Frequency is time. Uh -huh. it's, it's all vibration, yeah? Yeah. And frequency. So you've got a sine wave and so here you've got, space, wave amplitude, and here you've got, whoops, uh, time, wavelength. 
This is vibration and frequency, you see? So time, Saturn, Saturn's marking time, and Jupiter is making space for the time to manifest in. So they are father and son. They castrate each other. It's just like Cain kills Abel. Isaac tries to kill Esau. Um, it's, it, they're not killing each other literally because yeah. <laughs> it's not it's talking about this. One has to kill, one brother has to kill the other brother. You know, positive must kill negative, otherwise it can't go back to be positive again. And they're, and they're changing natures, flipping over. Radharani and Krishna, you know, Mary and Jesus. And it's all, it's all basically just the yin and the yang. And you've got source light and force light. And so... <clears throat> Um, I forget the point I was making, but anyway, I think I finished what I wanted to say. Uh, and and um, so <clears throat> that principle, that that is the principle. So having Saturn and Jupiter on the outside ring makes a lot of sense because um, Saturn is the beginning of all things. All things begin in Saturn. But then they say all things begin in Jupiter because Jupiter is air. Well, air is hot and um moist yeah and hot and moist are the two benefic humors of jupiter so whereas saturn is cold and dry so time it's cold and dry man there's no doubt about it isn't it yeah <laughs> ice is hot and moist yeah. and that's and those are the humors of saturn of the greater malefic whatever is dry and and cold cannot grow plants can't grow in the dryness if they're dry nor if they are cold they need jupiter which is the two good humors which are heat and moisture right so and that you see how heat creates expansion whereas coldness contracts so is is that is that um is that also reminiscent of the toroidal fields breathing in and out, creating the ages? So when yep. the toroidal fields are outwards, that is the expansion, is it, as you're saying? And then when they come back in and we're in the dark age of consciousness, this is when Saturn is ruling, cold and dry time. Yeah, so well, during the golden is... ages, Jupiter is, is, is king. Jupiter is, is the one ruling the energy. And during the... Uh, the darker ages of consciousness when all the toroidal fields have closed everything in, this is when Saturn is ruling. Yeah, yeah. Saturn, ah. Saturn, is, Saturn is the contracting in-breath yep. and the expanding out-breath. And, and the Taurus field is always doing this. Hence, you have the tides yep. of the ocean. You have the earth heaving and then resting and heaving. The earth is always... I, I learned this when I was um, selling um, a house, new home salesman. I did that for four years. And uh, you, you had to go out and do uh, testing the ground, the soil, the quality of the soil. Was it A soil? Was it B? And all different grades of soil to build on. So to build a new, how much to put in the foundations. Yeah? And um, but I learned about this heaving, you see. Yeah, yeah. Certain, soil, certain soils heave a lot. In, in the summer and in, in the um, in the summer yeah uh, sorry in the winter with all the moisture and then they in the summer they um, withdraw and, and and so the house can can get cracked it can crack with certain kind of soils uh, so the this is the breath everything is breathing you see and Saturn is the principle of everything coming back to oneness and contracting hence Saturn is strict, stern, disciplined, um, has boundaries, clear boundaries, uh, right? Whereas Jupiter is expansive, loose, and the opposite. So it's, they're both, it's always Peter and Paul. So right now, as we speak, as we say, we're, we're, we're on the upward cycle of consciousness. Jupiter is on her way to um, taking over from Saturn, basically. Yep. That's, that's, uh, that's a good way to put it, right? 
Well, Jupiter's never going to defeat Saturn or vice versa. Yeah, they, they work in tandem, obviously, breathing in and out, like you're saying. Yep. But, but now the breath is, is, is going outward, isn't it? Whereas we were breathing inward consciously, we're now breathing outward consciously. We're now expanding, heading towards the golden age, so to speak, of yep. its openness, of no toroidal fields, no, we're all one, the whole Bumandala, all the worlds, we're all connected, we're all, we're all one, open. Yep, yep, yep. So, so Saturn was the ruler of the golden ages, not Jupiter. Jupiter caused all the four seasons, according to uh -huh. Virgil. Yeah. So it's the other so, way around. No, no, it's correct how you had it. I'm just, I'm, I have to add this to it because you have to understand that what you said is correct. Uh huh. Yes, but. In another mo in another modality, uh -huh. it's it's the other way around. Depends on which modality. Okay, so right. yeah, I, Saturn. I, I, um, when Jupiter castrated Saturn, the golden age ceased and the four seasons began. Okay, because that expansion of Jupiter unbalanced the ages. Okay, but in another modality, Jupiter is the finer one. He is the greater benefic and Saturn is the greater malefic. So Jupiter is, is the one that you go, to, you go to St. Peter at the pearly gates. See, if you look at the, um, it's interesting, I'm going to do a, a show on this. This is the Dendera stone of Egypt. Okay. okay. <clears throat> now, on here, you'll have, there are all the 48 original constellations, starting at Aries, just as I do all my maps, all my charts, Cancer, Libra, there's the scales. You can see the green scales there. Uh -huh. All the green, the green ones in here. Yep. Yeah. Okay, all these green ones, so... There's Libra, right there where I have my Libra always. Virgo, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries. Now, they've got all of these deacons, 36 deacons. So I'm going to do a presentation on this showing that this was around for thousands and thousands of years and all these signs are exactly the same as the modern ones today. <laughs> no, yeah, no difference at all. Not, not, a, not, a, not a, um, a bit of difference. All I, the only discrepancy is a couple of the deacons of Libra. Um, I can't seem to find them on the Dendera stone, but all the rest, they're all there, all right, intact. So this... This absolutely smashes these guys who say that um, the Greeks added Libra 2,000 years ago. Well, this is more than 5,000 years old, and there's Libra, you know, and, and, and certain deacons and certain things were added. Well, this is the oldest, and it's the same, it's exactly the same as the Ptolemy system. Ptolemy actually gives us a list of the 48 constellations the 36 extra zodiacal deacons and the 12 zodiacal. Um, now, I forget why I pulled this out. I was going to say something. Can you bring me back to the subject? Why did I come to this? Uh, Saturn, Saturn and Jupiter, we were explaining the ages. Uh, the, uh, uh, we were saying that uh, Jupiter was expansive, of course, and Saturn was... Uh, restricting but i must say martin uh, uh, the restriction is also sometimes needed in the sense of how you understand saturn in a sense because as i said he gets a lot of uh, bad vision and uh, uh, of course everyone you know the satan thing and everything else blah 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 but uh, he is also a needed and can also be a gift in many ways if you actually understand uh, sometimes what these planets are representing yeah 
Yep. And that, is it that trinity there that Sandals was pointing out, the, just the Jupiter and the Saturn, uh, the two planets together? I mean, that, that, that's like the, the mother load of all astrotheology, that, that those two together, they, they really do sing in so many areas. When you understand that, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter. Now, I remember why I pulled this out. At the bottom here, the Tropic of Cancer, Saturn rules in winter. He rules Capricorn and Aquarius. So he's always down the bottom, down in hell, where Saturn, Satan is supposed to be, always here, ruling these 60 degrees of the ecliptic. From the Tropic of Capricorn all the way to the 20th of Mar um, February, from the 21st of December. That there, and here, this is this is where all the good stuff ha happens in Sagittarius, who it's who is ruled by Jupiter. So you see, Sagittarius and Jupiter. This is the ninth sign, the ninth heaven, and so Jupiter is Peter, Saint Peter, at the pearly gates. So when you actually, um, the all the ancients and the Neoplatonists said that the souls incarnate at the, at the Tropic of Cancer come through into the solar system at the Tropic of Cancer, and that's where the moon rules, and leave at the rings of Saturn at the Tropic of Capricorn. But just before, just before Saturn gets his rulership here in, a, in Capricorn and Aquarius, St. Peter, Jupiter, is here in heaven at the pearly gates. This is where you go to the ninth heaven. To Jupiter's um, sign and the deacons interesting that the deacons of Sagittarius one of them's called the harp Lyra with Vega in it Lyra is in other words a guitar yeah so what do you see what do you see people doing at the gates of the pearl near the pearly gates in heaven you see yeah. them playing a harp yeah and then there's another deacon called Ara which is an altar and it, it's called the censer or the incense holder or vessel and this is where zeus jupiter offered incense on the altar to the gods when just before he was going to defeat Cronos, his father and the titans so the olympians they offered at the altar ara in heaven, they, um, as Zeus, Jupiter, before he defeated, sorry, Zeus, Zeus, Jesus, Zeus. I like that, Zeus. You worship a Zeus, your Jesus. So, so you see, here we have all the themes. Um, Sagittarius. This is also in astro theology. Sagittarius is the Garden of Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives because Sagittarius rules the back of your head here where you have two olives. And, and this is the Mount of Olives because it's high up in your body, you see. So, so and Draco is the third cons, um, deacon of Sagittarius and Draco is the dragon or the devil. And what does Jesus encounter in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives? The devil. Yeah, yeah. So, you see, so all of these, all of these deacons and the whole everything, the whole story of Sagittarius and the rulership of Jupiter, just before the sun hits the Tropic of Capricorn, where Saturn begins on the twenty-first of July, uh, 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 December, just before that is where all the heavenly action occurs, and that's what the ancients say. You know that through the the arrow of the Sagittarian. Um, you know, you, you send your wishes and you, you send your hopes and you are saved by that deliverer. He is the delivering sign. It's called the delivering sign. So um, when, you, when, you, when you get to know all this, I mean, I've got so much information that I'm going to take out of this showing that what they're describing here is the 48 constellations. They are the 48 um, organs in your body 
okay? Aries is the cerebrum, right? Mm. Leo is the heart. So they're describing, explaining and modelling field mechanics. It's, it's Taurus field energy. They're describing it. They're, they're modelling how it works. And they're telling you where all the positions of the, the 36 deacons um, are, are indicating what archetypal arc, arch, archetypal energies are found as the vortex d does its cycles. And, and so it, in every wave and in every field, when <clears throat> energy is traveling through the field, it does this. This is what the Egyptians are telling us here. They didn't make the ecliptic and the constellations and they didn't design any of this. This is how things work. This is like a blueprint of things that how energy actually works. This is the original. Original quantum mechanics, yeah. Yeah, it's the only way to model because what you're doing, see, with, with your model, you've got four nested torus fields. Well, have a look at an atom. Don't they have different rows of electrons? You've got the first one, the shell. Yeah. Yeah, how many shells do they have? Ten? Or they have about four shells, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So you see, they tell you that an atom, right? Let's say carbon. It's just about to cut off. We're running out of time, about 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. Okay. We might have to re -loop. It's up to you. Do we need to keep going? Um, no, can we schedule another time? Because I've got to work in 15 minutes. Yes.